Hey, 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 my incredible time traveling friends. It's your buddy Kronos, back with another mind blowing episode of What If? on our amazing channel. Can you believe it? We've reached part 10 of our epic series. What if Deku became Saitama? Get ready to have your minds blown as we dive deeper into this alternate universe. So grab your popcorn, sit back, and let's embark on this extraordinary adventure together. Chapter 26 The Power Once Earned It was the middle of the afternoon, and in Kamino Ward. A blonde cyborg walks the streets making his way to the address he was given. He arrives at the location, scopes out the area, and keeps an eye on the place. There seems to still be no activity here, he thought to himself. One had contacted him this morning and let him in on a plan to take down the League of Villains, and he was more than in. He had been hanging out in Kamino all day, keeping an eye on both the League and All for One's hideouts. When the sun went down he could go into the next stage of the plan, but for now he waited. At the training camp. Ayaha! Kirishima roared as he threw a right haymaker at one who easily deflected the punch with his left hand before pummeling the hard-skinned redhead with a barrage of punches to his left side and face. Kirishima grunted in pain after he was knocked away and flipped across the ground after a brutal punch to his ribs. One raised his right arm just as Ojiro tried to smack him with his tail from behind. He blocked the attack. Ojiro was about to spin right and hit him from the left but one quickly dipped and spun left, hitting him with a fast, high spin kick that sent him across the training field. He turned left just as he was rushed by Kendo, her fist enlarged and ready to fight. I'm not done yet, one! She declared as she unleashed a full power flurry of punches. One's fists met hers, matching her blow for blow with his smaller fists having much more power behind them. Their clash could be heard across the training ground and after a while Kendo began to slow down. Her hands were hurting like crazy and the more she pushed it the more it felt like it was punching a damn mountain. After half a minute Kendo reached her limit, she tried to throw another punch but one flipped, used her left fist as a vault, and spun to kick her on the left side of her head. The redhead skids across the ground in pain. One hears a roar. You have strong sense of Shishida, but you're not using them properly. He spun and his left fist found its way into the beast boy's gut. Air caught in his lungs as he hobbled back in pain. Remember what I said. Feel the life all around you. See it, feel it, smell it, hear it, taste it. How many times do I have to say it? An attack intended to harm will be felt before it's launched and an attack intended to take your life will come with a distinct breath. Listen and feel for it. Shishida's body suddenly went on alert, and he lifted his head to dodge once jumping high kick that was a millimeter from connecting with his chin. Good, but... One spun, locking his legs around Shishida's neck and flipping back, bringing him down to slam the beast boy's head into the ground, his head making a small crater in the earth and stunning him with pain. One stepped away from the beast boy who groaned in pain. Don't get cocky! Kamakiri exclaimed as charged at one with blades protruding from both his forearms. He threw a right slash and the blade shattered from one's chop. The mantis-faced teen ignored the pain of another shattered blade and tried to hit him with his left, only for one to catch it between his right middle, index fingers and thumb. This is training. Plus I'm here to whip you all into shape. So I'm definitely taking this seriously, Kamakiri. He said confidently with a smile that gave him chills before breaking the blade between his fingers and kicking him through the air. Kamakiri corrects himself and lands, produces more blades and comes back at one. The Mantis teen went all out against the independent hero. However, his blades were shattered over and over again from a single chop from the hero. With each shattered blade he would produce a new one only for it to be shattered like the rest. He was exhausted. He threw another right slice with the blade being stopped by the hero's hand. Your eyes are good for tracking small movements, but that can either be advantage or a distraction. Kamakiri took in his words as he struggled against his blade-like hand. Don't get distracted by deceptions and feints. You need to be able to discern an attack intended to take your life. Feel the life around you, not just yours, but your enemies too, and the heightened stress will help you greatly he said as the blade started to crack. A real attack, 
one that is intended to kill you will always come with a distinct breath. You need to listen for that. Breath of life. Dot. Kamakiri's blade shattered as one took a swift yet crisp breath. Like the one I just took. He sliced Kamakiri diagonally, only cutting his clothes. Kamakiri backed up from the shock of one's blade-like hand, dropping to one knee and touching the fabric of his now-sliced gym uniform that exposed his chest. Damn it, he said irritated. One held his hand down, still in the stance of when he sliced Kamakiri's shirt, he met eyes with his fellow greenet. So Kamakiri, I count twenty-seven blades. Surely you've got more up your sleeve. He goaded him with a smile. Kamakiri glared at him. A whistle was blown signaling the end of the training day. It was seven o'clock in the afternoon and all of the students looked exhausted, especially those who had been training with one. He had been assigned a group of students to help train and improve their quirks. Kirishima and Ojiro had already asked to train with him and Shishida. Kendo and Kamakiri had joined in as well. After learning their quirks he was able to quickly come up with ways for them to train. The whole day was a combination of quirk and combat training. He pummeled Kirishima. While training Ojiro to increase the strength and control of his tail, Shishida trained his body while using his senses to improve his combat ability. Kendo's hands became stronger and her martial arts increased by throwing his power against hers and Kamakiri's blades became sharper. Harder and his projection speed increased by constantly breaking them. All in all his group did pretty good for their first day. Most of them could barely stand as he held back enough to push them without seriously injuring them. One looked around at his down and exhausted group. Kirishima was on his back barely able to stand. Ojiro was on all fours breathing heavily. Shishido was trying to pick himself up off the ground. Kendo was on bended knee nursing her hurting head while Kamakiri was stuck with exhaustion. Come on guys! We've only been at this for 10 hours, surely you can keep going? The entire group silently groaned, most of them could barely move as it was. Once pushed them to overcome their limits over and over again today, none of them had anything left to give. However his words and their acknowledgement of him made some at least try, most notably Kirishima, who pushed past all the pain coursing through his body to stand up again. Of course I can keep going, I was never gonna quit. No way, he said, pained through deep breaths. The green-clad hero looked at the spiky redhead. He cleared the distance between them in the blink of an eye and poked his right middle and index fingers into his chest. His sudden appearance startled the other boy who was in so much pain he couldn't even fall back. There's a fine line between never giving up and tough talk, Kirishima. Before you say things like that, at least be able to activate your quirk. These words hit the redhead who suddenly registered he couldn't activate his quirk, and when he tried his skin was slightly tougher, not even comparable to his basic hardening. He watched as one walked over to Kendo. You okay Kendo? She groaned lightly as she rubbed her head. I'll live. She gave him a small smile. Thanks for the training, your martial arts is better than I thought one. Thanks, you've got some skills too. Your fundamentals are solid. You know how to use your body's strengths and you're good at incorporating your quirk with your martial arts. Kendo smiled accepting the compliment. Thanks, but I've still got a long way to go. Even when I teamed up with Ojiro we couldn't score one hit on you. It's all about practice. Remembering your training and learning your lessons truly counts despite how repetitive it can be. I'll try to remember that. One gathered his group together and they walked to join up with the others. How's the tail, Ojiro? Pretty numb, but I can tell it's getting stronger, he said, smiling through his pain and exhaustion. That is the end goal. One then turned to Shishida. What about you, Shishida? Body's really sore. You're a lot more intense than I expected, one. Not really. I just need to whip you guys into shape. Help you, though. Plus ultra. If you will. The beast boy laughed. Well, you doing good for your first day. Kamakiri spoke up. Speaking of, I've never met someone whose hands are stronger and sharper than my blades. He met the mantis teen's eyes as they walked. That all goes back to martial arts, Kamakiri. 
It's an advanced karate technique whereby strengthening one's hand the strike of your chops can mirror a blade. Do you think you could teach me that sometime? Kendo asked. Sure, I don't see why not. While we're on the subject of martial arts, just how many do you know, one? Ojiro asked. I'm a master of five, but I know six in total. He answered. Which are? Kendo asked. Karate, Taekwondo, Wing Chun, Muay Thai, and Japanese Jiu-Jitsu. I've mastered those and picked up Kenjutsu. Both Kendo and Ojiro were surprised to hear so many different styles. They figured he knew more than one but for him to know this many it wasn't surprising anymore he was such a good fighter. They linked up with the rest of the students, and one went to speak with some of the other students. The group he helped train for the sports festival had pushed it hard today and were looking less dead when compared to everyone else. He approached Subarama who was next to Kaibara. Ironically the training they had been doing all day was the same one he recommended that day at the tavern. Hate Subarama. He said as he lightly popped him in the stomach, the brunette immediately dropped to the ground, clenching his stomach with a weak. Why? He had been doing the breathing technique the hero had recommended all day, and it felt like his lungs were going to burst through his ears. One looked at the down brunette. Natural reaction, good to know you've been doing it right. Subarama held his stomach while curled up on the ground. What cruel god would make breathing so hard? One raised an eyebrow behind his cowl. Pick one, I guess. He helped the brunette stand up and looked around at the others, faces of exhaustion all around. Pixie Bob and Ragdoll were ahead of the group standing near a table full of ingredients. All right, remember what I said? We're not making your food anymore, Pixie Bob stated. Ragdoll waved her hand in an excited fashion. If you want to eat, you're gonna have to make your own meals. Starting with curry. She exclaimed excitedly. Yes, ma'am. Everyone groaned. Ragdoll couldn't help but laugh at their sorry state. Oh man, you guys look exhausted. But that doesn't mean you can coast by making sloppy cat food. She's right, you know. One added. It's a hero's responsibility to look out for people until all their needs are met. So quit complaining. Ida was the first to register his words, shaking off his own exhaustion. I see. Part of saving someone from a disaster is caring for their physical needs, as well as spiritual. What a wonderful opportunity. Let's make the best curry in the world, everyone. Okay. Everyone dryly replied. Eraser head looked at the scene. Thank you, one. Ida drove that home, but they wouldn't have figured that out on their own. The hero thought to himself. As he looked at the independent hero who was helping the students get situated, he recalled the conversation they had early this morning. Flashback earlier that morning. The students had been broken off to do their individual training with the pussycats having set up the training ground. One had been assigned a group of students to train and had them wait as he spoke to Eraserhead. He wanted to know the real reason why he changed his mind and just showed up at the training camp. They found an isolated area to talk and the older man's eyes narrowed when the hero explained. The villains know where we are and they're coming. That's right. I knew they were planning something and I pieced together last night that this is what. One answered calmly. Eraser had registered his words as he thought to himself. This all but confirms what one of the students was responsible for the information leak. None of them knew where the camp was going to be until yesterday. One of them very easily could have told them once they got here. He met the other hero's eyes. How did they get that information? Obviously one of the students tipped them off. I've been spying on them for a while and their leader didn't get the intel about the change in location until last night. Do you know what they want or when they'll be here? They'll show up sometime tonight. As for what they want, it seems just to show that they can do this. You guys drop the ball again, and it'll shake up the public's faith in you even more than it already has. Eraser registered his words. He hated to admit that he was right. Despite the precautions they had taken, they were still found out. Many thoughts went through his mind. Which of the students tipped them off? Do we cancel the training camp? How many villains are coming? What mattered the most was notifying Mizu and keeping the peace. 
he turned to one. So what exactly is your plan? I'm ending this tonight. I have a guy monitoring their hideouts. We have the element of surprise and they don't know we're onto them. So my being here is a trap they're unknowingly walking into. He explained confidently. Eraserhead gave one a serious look. Come on, I need you to explain all of this to Nises so we can plan accordingly. He said, gesturing to the hero to come with him. No. What? I'm only telling you this because I'm certain you weren't the mole. Tell Nisa if you want but leave this to me and my partner, we've got this. Urser had gave him a look of incredulousness. Are you seriously saying to leave this to you and do nothing after what you just told me? I'm saying I don't trust how you people do things. If you were more meticulous you wouldn't have needed me to tell you this. In the same breath I could have kept all this to myself but I'm extending a little trust here. Trust? You just said you don't. How is passing along information and expecting us to do nothing trust? One faced the hero, unflinching. Because you don't know how deep this goes. The leader of the LOV is a bad guy and is the head of many villainous operations with connections all over Japan if not the world. The Nomu, the League, that situation on I Island it was all him and that's just the most recent on a long, dark and twisted career of crime. He paused for a moment. You and I may never understand each other, but try to understand that someone like me is the only one who can nail him. He's scared of me. He's not scared of all might. So let me handle this. Eraserhead took in his words. The tone behind them did slightly move him, but it wasn't enough. He couldn't trust the safety of the student and Yue's credibility to one of all people. While this did seem like a step in the right direction, this was not an appropriate time for that. He needed to notify Nizu and he would do the rest. They had to counter the impending attack as best they could, to protect the students and send a message to the villains. He doubted one would help with any of that but he could at least train the students, and once this was settled they would move forward. He sighed before facing the hero. One, you're welcome to stay and help our students train. But I'm going to do what's necessary for the good of everyone. He turned and walked away from the independent hero. Back in real time. After a while, everyone had changed out of their gym clothes and began preparing the meal. Several Class A students were by the barbecue pits ready to set the firewood beneath them on fire. Hey Todoroki, can you give us a hand with this? Ashido asked. Sure. The heterochromatic teen replied before using his left hand to set the wood on fire. Thanks a bunch, Todoroki. Rely on others and you'll never learn to start a fire yourself. We should focus on acquiring new skills, Momo said as she created a lighter and set the firewood ablaze. Jiro was behind her and with a combination of exhaustion and annoyance just groaned at that statement. Siro stood next to one. Hey one, use your fire to light some of these barbecue pits? Sure. One swirled his hands in front of him until they caught fire. He did a quick pose before firing several fireballs that ignited the wood. With a clap the fire coating his hands has extinguished. Oh yeah! Burn baby burn! Ashido cheered at once work. But not too hot okay, Yuruika said with a smile. It's fire Yuruika, kind of a hard ask, one said with a small chuckle. Todoroki who was watching that, finally understood. I see, so that's how you do that. Everyone turned to the heterochromatic team. Your fist moves so fast the friction ignites the hydrogen in the air resulting in them catching fire. All who heard this turned to the green-clad independent hero, waiting for his response. One merely smiled. Very perceptive Todoroki. You don't necessarily need a fire quirk to wield fire. His casualness shocked everyone who heard these words. That's insane! Aways exclaimed. Wow, he's more impressive than I thought. Kendo said with a smile as she looked at the hero. Tokage, who was next to her, gave her a mischievous grin. You've been Loki crushing on him for a while, Kendo. We're done training so now's the perfect time to talk to him. The redhead blushed slightly as she turned back to the vegetables in front of her. Maybe later. 
As this was happening a blonde boy from Class B was gripping his chin with a sly smirk after having heard this most recent information. Something one of his classmates noticed. What's with the evil look Monama? Shoda asked. Evil? I'm offended Shoda, I'm just impressed. Monama went back to what he was doing, very much intending on trying to copy once Quirk before the day was over. Ciro noted a pit that wasn't burning that Bakugo was crouched in front of. Hey Bakugo, use an explosion to light that. This is so beneath me. Bakugo complained before firing an explosion that destroyed the pit. Too much. Tokoyami stated at the sudden destruction. One side. Bakugo, remember this is someone else's property. The blonde merely gave a TCH before getting up and walking away. Is he always so impetuous? He asked, not sounding rhetorical. Pretty much, Urarika answered. The sun had gone down and the food was prepared. After giving thanks for the food, everyone dug in. One sat at a table with Momo, Jiro, Kaminari, Kirishima, Siro, Yururika, and Ajui. While the food wasn't great it wasn't terrible, and everyone was so hungry they truly didn't care. If I got this in a restaurant I'd send this crap back, but after today I'll eat every bite. Kurishima stated as he munched away. Don't say that, Siro said, defending the work everyone put in. Ashido, who was sitting at the next table, leaned back impressed at seeing Momo eat. Wow, you're scarfing Momo. Momo closed her eyes looking dignified. Her upbringing had instilled in her proper table manners, so even if she wasn't pigging out like the rest of the students, her amount of consumption was still impressive. Yes. My quirk transforms lipids into brand new atoms to create inorganic materials. Therefore, the more I eat, the more I can make. She said proudly. Like how Pook works. Ciro joked with a mouthful of food. One snickered next to Momo causing her to look at him shocked. A chuckle escaped him. Sorry, Yairoza, but you gotta admit you walked right into that one. Momo hung her head from that blow to her pride. She accepted the burn and went back to eating. One looked to his right and saw the kid from earlier walking away towards the woods. Koda, we're having dinner. Mandalay came out looking around. Where are you? One had noticed that the kid named Koda had been spying on the group periodically throughout the day, and he was curious about him. The boy was clearly the loner type, but he sensed there was more to it. It was getting late, and he would surely be hungry. Plus he had to check on the LOV. They would be here in time, and the last thing he needed was for someone to be alone in the woods when they showed up. Koda was already gone into the woods. I'll be back, everyone. He said to the people at his table before getting up and making a plate of curry. He followed the boy's footsteps all the way to a cave on the side of a mountain. He found him standing on the cliffside just looking out to the nature below. He didn't make a sound as he approached, and he could hear the boy's stomach rumbling. Oh, I hear a rumbly tumbly. His sudden voice surprised Koda and turned to see one walking towards him with a plate of curry. Koda was surprised to see the green-clad hero, but he kept his neutral angry expression, slightly annoyed. The last thing he wanted was to be around a hero. At school he couldn't go a week without hearing about this guy as all his classmates loved him. It annoyed him to no end. One had made it to the cliffside. Don't worry, Lil Furry, here's some curry. He rhymed playfully with a welcoming smile. His presence irked Koda. Get lost. Go back to camp with the other losers. And forget all about my secret hideout. One smile didn't falter. I was. He raised the food. But a growing boy's gotta eat, doesn't he? Koda didn't answer him. One took a couple steps and looked inside the cave and then the woods below. This is a pretty cool secret hideout. I notice you've been spying on us all day. You know if you want to be around the rest of us all you have to do is ask. Koda shot him an angry look. Like I'd ever want to be around a hero. You're dumb. One was surprised by his words. The look in his eyes was telling. This boy was hurting inside. I take it you're not a fan of heroes, are you Koda? He looked off the cliffside. All of you are so stupid always showing off and focusing on your quirks. 
So pointless to want to be a hero, he said mockingly. One stopped smiling, noting how serious he was. What's so pointless about it? Using your abilities to help people is what being a hero is all about. These words seemed to anger him. TCH. Even if you die and leave people behind? One took in his words, and they were truly telling. At first he thought he was Mandalay's son, but that's not the case. Kota hates heroes and quirks. It was almost surreal to think a child could think that way as almost every kid his age wants to be a hero. Kota, you're too young to understand this, but in this world the only way for evil to triumph is for good people to do nothing. Being a hero comes with the risk of death, but doing something is always better than doing nothing if it means saving lives. Kota turned to him, remembering Mandalay saying something similar once. Noting the slight ease in the boy's eyes, one decided to press on. May I sit down? Do what you want, Kota answered, turning away from him. One placed the plate on the ground and sat down on the cliff. The wind blew and the quiet calmness of nature was all around them. I can see why you like coming up here. It's a beautiful scene, probably better during the day. Kota sat down next to him, put the plate in his lap and started eating the curry. He took a couple bite before looking at the hero who was still enjoying the landscape. Hey Koda, you can keep a secret, can't you? Koda swallowed his food and registered his question. Sure. I didn't inherit any abilities from my parents. Koda's eyes widened at this revelation. Huh? One could hear his confusion. It's a hereditary thing. These days it's very uncommon. When I was your age I tried to breathe fire and used telekinesis, but nothing ever happened. Still, I wanted to be a hero more than anything, so I trained my body, mind and spirit as much as possible to make it happen. Koda's angry look had softened upon this information. Why? He said weakly, confusion prevalent in his tone. One turned to him, his tone of voice highlighted his confusion. He truly didn't understand why someone without a quirk wanted to be a hero. If he doesn't have a quirk he can't show off, but he's also so strong. Because it's my dream. I don't wear this suit to show off, I wear it because it's a representation of the vows I made to myself. He looked the young boy in the eyes. Always believe, and never give up on myself. Become the greatest hero I can be. And prove that quirkless doesn't mean powerless, or useless. Kota lowered his head as the hero's words hit him. He continued to eat. As he did he thought about what the hero had just said. Heroes only care about showing off their quirks, calling each other names like hero and villain and killing each other over it. That's why his parents are gone. But if he doesn't have a quirk what's so good about being a hero that he wants to be one anyway? In Kamino Ward, Genos was on the roof of the building across from the LOV hideout. Since the sun had gone down he had been observing the area from above. The league was assembling, and as of right now Dobby, Toga, Twice, Spinner, Mustard, Muscular, Moonfish, Mr. Compress and Magni are the only ones to arrive. He was using his scanners to hear everything that was going on inside, at the moment Shigaraki was going through the plan. And that's the whole plan. Any questions? Muscular perked up. Just one. We're allowed to kill as many as we want, right? As long as it's not one of the targets, go for it. Shigaraki answered. Color me surprised, Shigaraki. You actually came up with a plan. Dabi commented. By the way, you're in charge, Dabi. Kuro Jairi stated. All right. He said nonchalantly. Jiren's brought support items that fit some of you. Lastly, there's someone else that will meet you at the camp. Try not to get on their bad side because they're technically not on ours. Also, Nomu won't be ready until tomorrow. If you want to go tonight then fine but extra muscle won't hurt. They all went through a portal made by Kuro Jairi and were gone. The plan has started Tamura Shigaraki. How do you think they will fare? We have the complete element of surprise. Even if they fail, the fact they could do this will shake society's faith in UA as well as heroes. He picked up a picture of an angry Bakugo bound up at the sports festival. Plus, villains aren't the only ones that are oppressed. 
You think this child will join us? Look at him. Does this look like a hero to you? Even if he doesn't join us willingly, he can still be of use to us. Genos had heard everything. Standing up, he readied himself for step two. Just as one anticipated, the villains have begun their attack. He then took out his phone and let him know the bugs had also been planted on muscular, moonfish and dowby so one could get them whenever he wanted. So their leader will have a gnome ready for them by tomorrow. He thought out loud before he paused and collected his thoughts. It's finally dark. Let's see what you're doing in there, AFO. He thought before heading back to the villain's hideout. There were few people walking the streets when he arrived. The streets seemed pretty quiet. Perfect considering it was a villain hideout. Genos crept in the shadows at the side of the building where he found an open window with bars on it. Genos closed his right eye, seeker eye. His left eye popped out of its socket and floated in front of him. His vision was still linked and he could see through it. Controlling it remotely he sent it through the window. The eye floated across the room looking at what was inside. His sight fell on several tubs full of a green liquid that was the only light source in the room. As his eye got closer Genos became more and more disgusted as he made out what he was seeing. In each and every tub there was an exposed brain of a developing Noma. Genos' eye floated above the scene, his sight completely locked on what was before him. Outside he clenched his fist with anger. Disgusting, you sick bastard, so this is it. This is your Noma factory. Back at the training camp, Bakugo had just finished eating and decided to take a walk along one of the trails. The first day of the camp was in the books but after bath time he would have to do shitty remedial courses with the other extras. He may have trained hard today, but he still felt stuck. His consistent failures continued to piss him off, not to mention one was here and personally trained with the others, two of which Aizawa flat out stated were ahead of him. These losers are getting ahead of him. The remedial courses weren't a help they are a waste of time. He needed to improve. He needed to blow by everyone here as quickly as possible. As he rounded the corner of the trail he suddenly felt a twinge in his chest. The air in his lungs left his body and formed a sphere around his head. He couldn't breathe at all. No air in or out and his eyes were going red from suffocation. This was clearly someone's quirk and he was being attacked but he couldn't see at all who it was, the darkness, coupled with the air sphere made it hard to see or hear anything. He truly felt like he was about to die when his stomach was hit with such force everything went black, and he fell into the void. On the cliffside, Koda had finished eating and he and one were just sitting on the cliff. One was looking at his phone and as he was eating he couldn't stop thinking about what the hero had told him, one didn't have a quirk. As he was trying to make sense of what he said when the hero suddenly perked up. Hey Koda, do you mind telling me what your quirk is? He asked with a smile. Water gun. He mumbled, just audible. Water gun, huh? Can I see it? He asked with a warm smile. No! He exclaimed. Come on. You can't say you have a quirk called. Water gun. And not show it to me. I want to see if you're Blastos or not. His lips morphed into a sly grin. Oh wait, never mind. You're just a kid so you're definitely more like Squirtle right now. He said goading him. His words trigger some repressed memories in Kota. It was a time when his parents were still alive. His quirk had manifested and he was having fun with it. His mom had lined up some empty soda cans and bottles for target practice. All right, my little Blastoise, take the shot. Koda smiled excitedly, put both his hands in front of him, and fired streams of water. The streams were weak, but they were strong enough to knock over two of the cans. However, a bottle wouldn't come down. Koda shot two more streams at it, only making it wobble a bit. He pushed a little harder, and his streams managed to knock it over. Yeah! He cheered to himself. Way to go, Koda! His dad complimented from behind him. Hey dad, did you see what I did? His smile shined brightly. I sure did. Nice shooting kiddo. But you've got a lot of work to do if you want to be a water hero too. Right now you're more like a squirtle than a blast to us. The father said with a cool smile. Don't worry dad, 
I'm gonna keep practicing with my quirk and I'm gonna be a better water hero than you and mom, he said confidently. Both parents laughed at the enthusiasm of their child. His dad crossed his arms while his mom who was behind him put her hands on his shoulders. I'm gonna hold you to that, his father said with a smile. Back in the present, there was a pause as Coda didn't even register the tears that slipped down his cheeks, something one noticed. Are you okay, Coda? Sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. His words were empathetic as the boy registered the wetness running down his face. Coda quickly wiped his face. I'm not crying, he exclaimed, sounding tough. If I made you remember something painful, I apologize. If you want to talk about it, I'll listen. Coda couldn't take it. His emotions were everywhere right now, and he was usually able to keep them bottled up. But this hero is frustrating. Everything about this was frustrating. Why? He said lowly. Why is everybody so crazy? Calling each other names like hero and villain and killing each other because of it. Always showing off and focusing on their quirks just so you can get killed. What's so good about that? He snapped. One, though slightly startled by his outburst, let him fully let out what he was feeling and say what he needed to say. There was pain behind his questions, he'd been relatively silent since he told him he was quirkless. The kid already didn't understand heroes and now he's even more confused. I bet I don't even register as his concept of a hero. One thought as he took in Kota's words. This entire time he had been studying the young boy and he'd come up with a theory as to where this pain, frustration and confusion towards heroes originated from. Coda, By any chance, were your parents the water hose heroes? With the water quirks. Coda clenched his fist and his body language became defensive. Did Mandalay tell you? No, she didn't. I'm a detective, kid. You told me even if you didn't say it. This explanation didn't change the look on his face. I'm sorry. I was actually a fan of theirs, and I remember reading about that incident a few years ago. Coda turned from him, fists clenched, and his head hung low. You asked me what was so good about being a hero. I can't speak for everyone so I can only give you my answer. He paused for a moment, choosing his words carefully while also speaking his truth doing right by others, and protecting those who can't protect themselves. Helping others however I can is what I love about this because this world could use more acts of kindness. Sometimes that's all that matters. People understanding, respecting and being nice to each other is all it takes to make a peaceful society. One's lips morphed into a warm smile, placing a gentle hand on Coda's head. I want to change things. I want to make a world where dignity, honor, and justice are the reality for everyone, and as a bonus it feels nice. Coda's eyes widened at his words. It may sound cheesy, but seeing people happy or thankful after doing something good for them just feels nice. His smile was so bright and warm Coda's negative feelings almost melted away. For most of my own life it hasn't really been like that. People haven't been the best to me simply because I don't have a quirk. I've heard it over and over. You can't be a hero without a quirk. But I've accepted that it's just a one-sided way of looking at it. What do you mean? Coda asked. I mean that there are two things when someone says that. One is obviously the first statement that you can't be a hero without a quirk. However, on the flip side of that, they're also saying, you can't be a hero without a quirk. Because I couldn't be. Once I realized that, that statement lost any and all meaning to me. I could be whatever I wanted. I didn't have to be like everyone else and fall short where everyone else does. One noted the change in his body language, he cocked his head. Come on, let's head back, he said nicely. Coda was still processing what he had just said, okay, he replied before taking a few steps. One picked the plate and spoon off the ground, he then got an idea. Hey, Coda, climb on, he said, crouching down, gesturing to the boy to climb on his back. Coda hopped on and clung to his back. One then fully stood up and held the boy in place with his free arm. All right, hold on because we're about to fly back, he exclaimed before leaping into the air with Coda letting out an excited and fearful scream while holding on to him for dear life. 
One sky walked through the air all the way back to the camp. After a while Koda adjusted and was amazed at how one was flying. His fear quickly faded into pure excitement as the hero flew over the lodge. They could both see people chilling outside. Several of them waved at them. Some were cleaning up dinner, and one decided to turn around when they passed over the hot springs and caught a glimpse of several girls from class be readying for a bath. Luckily they hadn't dropped their towels yet, that would have been a bad look for him. They landed in the picnic area where they ate dinner and found Mandalay talking with Eraserhead while several students chilled around the area. The cat was surprised to see one with Koda. More surprising of all, he was smiling a genuinely happy smile. There you are, Koda. Thanks for finding him one. She said as she approached the two with Koda getting off the hero's back. One raised the plate. And feeding him, I did two things. He said playfully while holding up two fingers. Mandalay smiled. And feeding him, I appreciate it. She then turned to her nephew. Koda, go get ready for bed, okay? Okay, he said without argument. Later one. He then walked into the lodge. Mandalay looked at the green-clad hero, many thoughts going through her head. I haven't seen him like that in a long time. What did you do? We talked. That kid carries a lot of pain, and he's confused. I like to think I helped him with that, at least a little. Mandalay took in his words. He wasn't wrong. Her nephew is a hurt and confused kid and even her dealing with him isn't easy on the best of days. But one was just able to come in and do it. She made a mental note to ask Kota about what they talked about later. Before his parents passed, Kota was always such a cheerful little boy. He hasn't been the same since they left. But to see him smiling just now gave her so much hope. Thank you, one, she said with sincerity. No need for thanks, Mandalay. Just being a hero. The woman nodded before walking back inside. He looked around for a familiar head of spiky ash blonde hair. Genos did his job, Intek did his job, now he knows Bakugo is a target and has got to keep an eye on him. Not spotting the blonde in the immediate area, he walked towards Kirishima who was talking to Siro. Hey Kirishima, you know where Bakugo is? I want to talk to him about something. Yeah, he went for a walk after he was done eating. The redhead answered. Now that I think about it, that was a while ago. Okay. One responded, hiding his concern. You know which way he went? I think he went that way. Kirishima pointed. Thank you. One spread his senses to find the blonde. Momo, who was sitting at one of the tables with a shido and hagakure, got up. I'll join you. Sure. No one around them questions this as the two head into the woods together. Once they were inside he spread his senses as far as he could and couldn't sense Bakugo. Momo walked next to him, now out of earshot she could speak. I'm not sensing Bakugo either so it's just us for now. Why are you really here, one? One spread his senses, confirming that for the moment they were alone. The League is here, I knew they were coming so I'm here to intercept their plans and bring them an AFO down. Momo's eyes narrowed. How did they even find this place? If I had to guess, one of the students tipped off AFO after you all got here. Because they didn't find out that info until last night. I already spoke to Eraserhead about this this morning. Momo's mind was rocked by this information, to think there was a traitor among them. It was good that Mr. Aizawa knew but to think one of the UA's Hero Course students was working for the other side was unfathomable. Now she had to go on with the knowledge that maybe one of her trusted classmates was a wolf in sheep's clothing and just setting them up. It then made sense to why he was looking for Bakugo. What does Bakugo have to do with any of this? According to Intec, they want to recruit him to their side. Momo's cat-like eyes widened in realization. Bakugo is rather repugnant in regards to what you'd expect from an aspiring hero. But do you think he'd go to the other side? Probably not, but that being said he could still become a pawn for them so we've gotta find him. One and Momo had exited the trail. It was a full circle so either he came back out and was just by himself somewhere or something really happened to him. Katsuki Bakugo landed hard on the ground after he was violently thrown by his assailant. He was unconscious but still breathing. 
That was too easy. You're welcome, said the man who had so easily captured one of their targets. He had an average appearance with prominent cheekbones with dark brown eyes, pale skin with black hair that spiked to the right side of his head. He wore a black jacket over a gray shirt with dark blue skinny jeans and black sneakers. Every member of the Vanguard Action Squad looked at him impressed. Well damn, you made that look easy, Dobby stated. It always is. This piece of meat, Moonfish said creepily. Can I cut him? Toga asked excitedly. Nice job, darling, Magni said. Way to go, Gale Breeze. You suck, Mr. Redundant Name. Twice cheered and insulted. He looked at the costumed villain, slightly annoyed. You're too loud. Anyway, call the Miss Guy. If he joins you or not, I don't really care. Once I'm fully paid, you can do whatever you want with him. Muscular was penned up for a fight. Come on. Just turn me loose. I'm ready to get started, he said excitedly while clenching his hands. Shut your mouth, you crazy bastard. I'm going to get Ragdoll, and you may want to pack it up and get the hell out of here. For what? The fun hasn't started yet, Dabby asked. Because once here for some reason, and I didn't sign up for that kind of smoke. Twice is the first to react to this revelation. One! He exclaimed, putting both hands on his head. Abort, 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 abort. We gotta go. He could legit kill me. Try to relax twice, Mr. Compress said. How can I relax? Last time I faced that guy, he took down my doubles with one hit. Panicking isn't going to help either, Mustard spoke up. Muscular let out a creepy yet excited chuckle as he smiled sinisterly behind his mask. One ha? Huh? He clenched his right hand before balling it into a fist. You pansies can go. I'm not going no damn where. Spinner spoke up. One was acknowledged by Stain as a true hero. Fighting him is definitely not why we came out here. Be that as it may, we have one of our targets. Let's send him to Shigaraki before we proceed further. Compress added. Dobby? Yeah, yeah. The patch-faced man said as he pulled out a button to call Kuro Jairi. Before he pressed it he turned to their other partner only to realize he was already gone. Back at the camp. Ragdoll was on watch duty over the bads. She sat in the lane on top of the wall and leaned back, making sure no one tried to scale the wall like how Mineta did the other night as Coda did. She could hear the Class B students wrapping it up and leaving the bath. Class A would be in shortly, and then she could go to bed. The students had done a good job for their first day of training, she was impressed with the effort of most of them, especially those who trained with one. She was able to talk periodically with the independent hero, but he was so focused with training the student he barely spoke to the other heroes. I wonder if he wouldn't mind teaming up with us again? Ryuko should watch her tendencies though, she thought as she leaned back in her chair. Ragdoll began to feel strange as her breathing suddenly became uneasy. The air in her lungs seemed to be pulled out and a sphere of air circled around her head. She couldn't exhale or inhale or even scream as she began to suffocate. Falling back in her chair she rolled on all fours as she grasped for air. She suddenly saw a figure appear before her. The air sphere made seem clearly difficult but the light allowed her to tell someone was before her. She was close to passing out, and her vision was starting to blur. The air sphere suddenly dissipated and for a moment she could breath. But before she knew what hit her she felt a kick to the stomach that knocked what little air she'd taken in back out of her. Darkness was all she could comprehend as she fell into the void unconscious. Wan and Momo had just exited the walking trail. They were unable to find Bakugo and his instincts were screaming that something was off. He spotted Eraserhead who was following his students into the lodge as it was now Class A's bath period. Eraserhead had spotted the green-clad hero and approached him. Momo turned to one and though she couldn't see his eyes she was sure Izuku was giving her a knowing look. With a small nod she left the hero and went inside. The two looked at each other for a moment. Don't you have remedial classes to teach? One asked. We'll begin after the students are done bathing. 
You told her what was going on, didn't you? I did. He answered calmly and casually. Eraser sighed. So, how are things right now? One said nothing, only pulling out his hero phone and opening up a map that indicated the phone's location and three more dots three kilometers away. So they're here. One pointed in the direction. Yeah, they're over there. They'll go get them shortly. Eraser had took in his words. Are our students in any danger? No. That being said, I just found out Bakugo is a target, and I think he may have gotten taken. He said calmly. Eraser's eyes widened. Bakugo. Why him? Apparently they want to recruit him. You think he would join them? Probably not. But you have to admit his personality and attitude don't exactly scream hero. Eraser had grit his teeth. He noted the flaws in Bakugo's personality and wanted to do something about it. But he had to acknowledge the boy's pride carries him too high. Granted he has talent but that personality and mindset of his, while not exactly being evil, it is a double-edged sword in his development. One sensed an unknown presence, he looked up in the direction, seeing nothing but there were definitely two people above them. Eraser had seemed confused by his sudden shift. What are you looking at? This presence seems familiar, but the other one, that's Ragdoll. He thought before leaping into the air and landing a spin kick to some invisible figure. They, along with Ragdoll, became visible with one catching the unconscious heroine and a black-haired man was sent to the ground with a loud crash. One landed and looked at the cloud of dust. Eraser had also looked at the scene completely shocked as he completely missed that. Ragdoll was being kidnapped and he had no idea. Damn. And here I wanted to avoid a fight. He said as the dust cleared and he patted himself off. One looked at the unconscious ragdoll in his hands, noting that she was breathing properly, just knocked out. He then looked at the attempted kidnapper, he vaguely recognized him. I know you. You know me do you? Well I only think I know you so take off that mask so I can see if I'm sure? Not gonna happen. He then put Ragdoll down before turning back to him. Why are you helping the League? I was recommended apparently. I don't care at all about those idiots but for me to get paid I need that cat. I already got one of the targets so hand her over. One was in his thoughts as he took in what the man had just said. They already have Bakugo, damn it. Leaving it to him to get kidnapped. All this just to recruit him. That villainous personality of his was on full display during the sports festival after all. But why target Ragdoll? He paused for a moment and it clicked. This is all for one. Ragdoll's search quirk could be a pain if he got it. Damn good that I noticed that and caught him. He thought as he responded. Hell no. Of course you'd say that. Fighting you is the last thing I feel like doing or would have expected when I came here. Oh well, can't be helped I guess. But you should know that as a hero you have more pressing matters to attend to so. The air began to swirl as he quickly made a massive tornado that then burst into a blast of air in all directions. The wind tore through the area. One had to hold Ragdoll and erase head from being blown away. The wind died down and the villain was gone. He's gone. One deduced. He sensed that he jumped when he released the wind but that same wind kept him from sensing him when he escaped, most likely by flying. Who was that? Eraser demanded. I forget his name, but as I recall he was a ninja I met once. Still, that guy was a factor he didn't know about. He wasn't on the list of the new members he's identified. Recommended? AFO must have hired him. Seeing this guy's face took him back to his training days, a trip he took with the masters and several students to a school of ninjutsu. A ninja? Eraser said surprised. He then grit his teeth at remembering the man's words. Damn it all! They were after Ragdoll too and they already had Bakugo. They knew they were coming and couldn't prevent any of this. He relayed once info to Niza earlier and to his annoyance the principal told him to trust one. He saw the trackers and saw that they were three kilometers away. They couldn't mobilize in time to deal with them with them already attacking. He had no choice but to leave this to one. 
Swallowing his pride, he faced the independent hero. One, save my student. One gave him a smile before walking away and crouching down. Of course, he said before leaping into the air like a missile homing in on his target. It's a bit early to receive your call, Dobby, the misty villain said as he appeared before the group in the form of a portal. We have a bit of a hiccup. Once here, he stated calmly. The black mist yellow eyes screamed in shock. What? Yeah, and Gale Breeze hasn't come back yet. But he did get one of them. He gestured to the still unconscious Bakugo. Plus I get the feeling we all may die if we stay here. Fine, you obviously can't take on one. We got at least one of the targets, so let's return to base and regroup. Thank you. Twice exclaimed as he practically dove into Kuro Jairi and through the portal. Ah, and I wanted to see if one was my type or not. Toga said before entering the portal. Magni, Spinner and Mr. Compress all went through the portal. Dabi grabbed the still unconscious Bakugo and went through while Muscular and Moonfish, who looked bloodthirsty, did not want to leave. Mustard complained about not getting to use his support item as he stepped towards the portal. In an instant the black mist suddenly dissipated and there was a loud crash that kicked up a lot of dust. This sudden action shocked the three remaining villains on the cliff as they all faced the cloud of dust. The dust cleared to the horror of Mustard but the excitement of Moonfish and Muscular it was one, gripping the metal brace of Kurojiri's real body. Hello guys, were you going somewhere? He asked with a sly smile. Kurojiri was horrified that he was now in the grip of the master's greatest obstacle. He tried to use his quirk when one gave a squeeze that bent his brace causing him to groan in pain. I remember you from the USJ. If you so much as try to use your quirk I'll crush this like a soda can. He didn't mean that threat but his grip on his brace and the wave of power aura he released made that threat feel very real. Mustard backed up with fear, knowing full well he was way out of his league. Muscular sneered behind his mask while Moonfish took a couple steps and began to salivate. Such meat. Get to work, get to work, he said creepily. One stood up while gripping Kurojiri's brace in his left hand. So they got away with the Bakugo. I should have noticed he was gone sooner. Doesn't matter, I'm still in control, but they'll notice if Kurojiri is gone for too long. Gotta wrap this up quick while everyone is still presumably at the hideout. He thought as he prepared to face the villains. Normally I'd tell you to give up. But I know you two came here for blood, so bring it on. He said confidently, not smiling as he stared them down. Fresh meat! Moonfish exclaimed as Tendril Blade shot from his teeth towards the green-clad hero. One disappeared in a flash and appeared behind the cannibal villain. All the teeth in his mouth shattered and he was suddenly pummeled by what seemed like the air itself before he was sent flying to the left where he went crashing through several trees. Both Muscular and Mustard had no idea what just happened. Muscular was so shocked by Moonfish's ass kicking he didn't register the blow to his left side that sent him flying. He bounced and skid across the ground before he was able to stop himself. He gripped his left side. He was certain all of his ribs were broken. He coughed up a little blood, ripped off his mask and lifted his massive body off the ground. He had the excited smile of a child who's finally able to do something they had to wait to do. Yeah, that's the stuff, he exclaimed. Go to a Masuji, aka the Cardinal Murderer Muscular. On paper you're the worst kind of villain, you don't have one problem with taking the lives of anyone. Be they heroes or innocent civilians. Tell me. Did it have to be this way for you? Was there ever a point in your adult life you strive to be different from what you are today? The hell is this a therapy session? I'm exactly what I want to be. Using my quirk as much as I want, however I want is all that matters to me. So, his body was then enveloped in muscle fibers and he lunged at one with his left fist cocked back. Nope. One met his punch with one of his own. The muscle fibers tore and the bones and muscular arm shattered to pieces. The blows sent the villain back a bit who roared in pain from his now useless arm. He stared down the hero whose body language was expressing anger, disappointment, and strangely calmness. In the blink of an eye he was kicked into the air. 
One leaped after him, shifting his body to where he was upside down. Waves of blaze, burning wind! He called out as he nailed muscular with brutal kicks so fast his feet caught fire. He spun his body as he kicked up upward creating a flaming spiral while also setting the villain ablaze. They were high in the air when one spun and got above the villain and delivered a final burning kick that sent him to the ground so fast and hard he made a massive crater that shook and cracked the entire cliffside. One landed and saw the down villain. Muscular was badly burned and beaten, but breathing. That's the downside of being a hero. You can't save everyone. The entire area was enveloped in a thick gas. Inhaling it didn't bother him at all. For some reason he was immune to poisons. He could sense mustard within the gas. He had quickly noted the villain's outfit and size. What are you doing? He asked sternly. Isn't it obvious one? And here I thought you actually had a brain in that head of yours. I don't have time to play with you. You're clearly an upset and confused middle school kid. You still have a chance to not end up like the other two. And trust me when I say moments like this will define the rest of your life. So stand down, or I'm taking you down. There was no response, only a gunshot. One raised his right hand and caught the bullet in between his fingers. Guns are the coward's weapon for a reason you know. He sensed mustard moving within the gas. His eyes shifted to the left knowing the villain was behind him. This is what I'm talking about. You bring a gun because you obviously can't fight and I'll bet you're not even immune to the effects of your own quirk, hence the need for the mask. Shut up! The villain roared as he fired five more shots into the gas cloud but one caught these easily. How does he see those coming? He thought to himself desperately. You're probably wondering how I know where you are, what you're doing and where you're aiming. Let's just say I've got ways. This is your final warning. I don't even need a gas mask. I'm trying to give you an out here. Plus you're out of bullets. Mustard pulled the trigger and saw he was truly out of bullets. What? Seriously, a Ruger Redhawk? An actually threatening villain would have had a Glock 19. And with that, you're out of chances. In a flash of speed one was in front of Mustard with his back to him, slamming a left back fist into his mask breaking it. Mustard felt the hit but it didn't knock him out. He backed up from the sudden pain in his face. You idiot! He yelled. The pain distracted him from the fact he's not immune to his quirk and inhaled some of it. He suddenly tries to cover his mouth but it was too late as he was put to sleep by the gas. The unconscious villain fell forward with one catching him before he could face plant. With Mustard having lost consciousness the gas faded away. And that takes care of that. You haven't won one. Kuro Jairi stated, still in the grip of the hero. The hero brought the brace up so they were making eye contact. Well, obviously. I still have to take down all for one, which I will do in less than an hour. The Miss Villain was surprised to hear this. Are you implying you know where the master is? I'll tell you once this is over. In the meantime, I have to secure these guys. In a flash of speed one collected the other two unconscious villains and leaped back towards the lodge. As he descended he shifted his body tossing all three of them off of him. They all hit the ground with a loud thud. One landed and the sound caused Eraserhead, Mandalay and Vlad King to come out. The heroine was shocked to see the three beaten men on the ground. He was sprawled on the ground and his arm looked a mess but she recognized one of them. One, Eraser had explained and the police are on their way. What happened? Vlad asked. Most of the villains got away but these three weren't so lucky. Also I got their getaway guy. He said, holding Kuro Jairi by his brace who groaned in embarrassment. That's the warp villain from the USJ. Where's Bakugo? Eraser had asked, concerned that his student wasn't here. Obviously not here. Don't worry, I'm still in control and I need these four restrained. Can I trust you all to do that? And Mandalay, before you understandably kick him just know I did plenty of that. He said, noting how she was looking at the defeated muscular with the eyes of an angry cat in predatory mode and ready to pounce. She sighed. Alright, thanks for saving Ragdoll by the way. No problem. Now I'm going to finish this. 
Eraser clenched his fists, angered. Don't worry, Eraserhead. I know where they took him. These three have dangerous quirks. Do not let them use them. He tossed Kurojiri to Vlad King. Take him. Do not let him use his quirk. In a flash he was gone, booking it towards Kamino. Going at Mach 20 he made it to the Eloli's hideout in no time. As he descended the stairs towards the bar he could hear Bakugo's angry screams from inside, indicating he was okay and he could sense all the villains that escaped were inside. One descended the steps and stood before the bar door, he brought a fist to his lips and cleared his throat. Taking a few breaths he began to bang on the door. I want to join your group! He exclaimed while doing his best impression of a fan-struck teenage girl. There was a moment of silence before he heard the sound of the door being unlocked when twice opened the door. Welcome aboard, newbie! Beat it, you scrub! One nailed the villain with a brutal kick to the chest that sent him crashing to the other side of the room. Everything moved in slow motion as he speed blitzed into the room. Bakugo was in a chair with his hands restrained to keep him from using his quirk. He slammed a fist into Dobby's gut before he spun and chopped Spinner in the neck. He kicked Magni in the shin before hitting her in the face and then kneeing Toga before uppercutting Shigaraki in the gut. He shifted back and slammed his right elbow in Mr. Compressor's stomach. He stopped and everything went back to normal with Dobby, Spinner, Magni, Compress and Toga dropping with Shigaraki bouncing off the ceiling before hitting the ground. Done and done he said confidently with a smile as he faced the restrained Bakugo. You okay, Bakugo? Doesn't it look like it? He yelled, ignoring the fact of how he got in this situation. It does, he responded jokingly. He swiftly broke the restraints, freeing the ash blonde and allowing him to stand up. Bakugo inspected himself, noting he was okay before facing the hero. How did you where these shitty villains were hiding out? I followed Shigaraki back here a few weeks ago and have been spying on them ever since. Bakugo's gaze narrowed at his words. Wait, did you know these idiots were gonna show up at the camp? I did. But I didn't learn you were a target until like half an hour ago. I was actually looking for you but by that time it was too late. That little hiccup aside, this all still went according to plan. Plan? Let them show up, take them down. Even if a few got away it would only give them a false sense of security only for me to show up at their door and crush them. Bakugo looked around at all the beaten down villains. What about the warping guy? He asked, remembering he was a part of the group and he hadn't seen him. One waved a hand. I took care of it. Assuming your teachers don't mess up, it shouldn't be an issue. Though annoyed he was in this situation, he wouldn't admit it but he was impressed. I'm out of here. He turned to leave. Wait, I have to restrain these guys. Plus I have to get you to the police before I deal with their leader. One got up reaching into one of the pockets on his utility belt and pulled out some restraints. He was about to round them up, starting with Shigaraki. As he got closer the villain suddenly grabbed his forearm. His mask had been knocked off and he had a sinister smile. Now turn to dust, one. The hero just took it as the villain's hand gripped his exposed skin. One didn't try to resist. A moment passed with nothing happening to the hero. Shigataki's arrogant look shifted to one of shock. W what the he dash. He tried to yell before his own forearm was gripped by one like a vice. Yeah, my body's pretty strong. He pulled the villain into a punch, fully knocking him out this time. He's just slightly tougher than I expected. One pulled out a restraint and tied up the villain and after a while he had everyone restrained. All the idiots are tied up, can we go now? Bakugo groaned, once already had to stop him from just taking off twice now. Relax Bakugo, there's an element here you're not understanding. Like what? He asked arrogantly. How bad the leader of the LOV is. I'm trying to do this as smoothly as possible so as to not tip him off. The TV screen on the bar suddenly came on. It's a bit too late for that one. The voice of All for One said, filling the room. Both boys turned to the screen when suddenly a gray goo appeared and consumed the bodies of the unconscious villains. Damn it, he's making a move. He probably noticed Kurojiri's absence. 
He thought as he turned to Bakugo as the same gray goo burst from his mouth and consumed him. Bakugo! He tried to grab him with the goo splattering and the blonde disappearing. Crap! That happened. He then noted how everyone had been warped by the goo just as six portals of it appeared before him and multiple Nomu came through them. Figures he can warp Noma here. Genos said his hideout was also the factory for these things. The hell is he doing over there? At AFO's hideout moments prior. Genos I was making its way through the halls of the hideout. He had witnessed dozens of developing Nomu it was more than disgusting. This building was much longer on the inside than it appeared on the outside and after a while he was sure he'd seen most of it. All for one was going down tonight, guarantee it. His eye made its way down a hallway where he could see a lit up room, floating under the door and made its way inside. Here he found a large man wearing a black, futuristic mask over his head and sitting in a chair. He sat in front of a computer screen and seemed to be in the midst of a conversation with another man. He was bald with large green lens goggles and a light brown bushy mustache. So tell me doctor, how are the high ends developing? Losing fist a while back was a blow, but as it stands Hood is finally fully developed and the rest are following suit. I'm happy to hear that, be sure to keep me posted. That being said, wasn't Tamura planning something tonight? Ijiko asked. AFO smiled. Yes, he's actually taking some initiative and galvanizing his forces. The plan they're inketing is one he himself came up with. Oh, so you're not lending a hand this time around. He'll have to grow up eventually, although I will admit I paid for a little extra muscle. I see. On an unrelated note, do you have any plans for dealing with one? I'm still having a hard time believing what you told me. AFO put a fist to his cheek. Yes, he doesn't have a quirk to speak of. I've felt it. His raw power goes far beyond anything one for all could ever be capable of. Ijiko was speechless as he watched his master through the monitor. AFO is notorious for always having a plan, with numerous angles of getting to it. But as he looked at him, though he wouldn't say it it was obvious he was afraid of one. Realistically how could he not be? Someone so powerful didn't have a quirk he could just take and bringing him to their side was out of the question. He's coming after me. These words snapped the doctor out of his thoughts. Continue to progress as planned, doctor. Understood, he said before ending his video call. AFO listened to what was going on at Tamira's place. He heard two unfamiliar voices. Wait, did you know these idiots were gonna show up at the camp? I did. But I didn't learn you were a target until like half an hour ago. I was actually looking for you but by that time it was too late. That little hiccup aside, this all still went according to plan. Plan? Let them show up, take them down. Even if a few got away it would only give them a false sense of security only for me to show up at their door and crush them. He was on to Tamira. For how long I wonder. He probably got Carlos and one followed him back to the house. AFO thought as he continued to listen. He heard what seemed like Tamira try to attack one, confirming to him he was immune to Tamira's decay. This revelation made him feel something akin to anger. Even Tamira's quirk has no effect on him, just how impervious is he? Tamira and his allies had been defeated and were being restrained by one. Kurojiri was gone and Kazumaki hadn't called about his money. Once been onto them for a while and he's planned every move with the complete element of surprise. Even he wasn't aware of any of this. Still, his hideout was still a mystery. He could help Tamira and go from there. He had several complete mid-level Noma downstairs, which should serve as a decent distraction. Back outside, Geno still crept in the shadows. He called his eye back as all the information he just learned was setting in. So, it's Ajiko. It was always Ajiko. One of the world's top quirk doctors is in league with AFO? Why and how? He thought as his mind shifted to one. One should have taken care of the league by now. He looked up towards the window. I'm right here. Should I take him down now or wait for one? He thought as his eye passed by the nomatubs with several of them rising up and a gray goo enveloping them and the monsters disappearing. He's sending those to the other hideout. 
Genos looked at his hand as his eye went back into its socket. In theory I could eliminate this building and all the Nomu in it leaving me with just AFO. I still haven't unleashed my full capabilities yet. He made a fist and smiled. I've decided. Genos readied an incineration cannon, aimed it at a downward angle and fired. The building was incinerated by his blast creating a massive wave of fire that shot into the sky. The blast dissipated leaving nothing but flat burned earth. Genos stepped forward to find his enemy had been severely burned by his attack. Been waiting all day to do that. He stated as he faced the injured AFO. He couldn't see his face, but the cyborg could tell he was angry and could see his flesh slowly regenerating from his attack. Not a very enviable regeneration quirk you've got there. The taller man rose up. A fiery sneak attack. Seems very unheroic, don't you think? I've been spying on you fools all day. I know all about you and gave you a 40% chance of surviving that relatively weak blast. You attack me unprovoked. You're either extremely arrogant or extremely foolish. Genos raised a hand that emitted light and readied an attack. Oh please. You're nowhere nearly as powerful as you think you are. All you do is take and indulge in your endless greed for power. The way I see it, you have two choices, ratchet fool. Either be eliminated by me, or be utterly destroyed by one. Not very preferable options, are they? AFO had fully healed and most of his suit was burned away, namely his sleeves and pants legs. That attack did quite a number on him. Admittedly, when he first felt it he assumed it was Endeavor, the weak blast, as he called it may have killed him if he wasn't wearing his mask. Since one easily destroyed his previous one he had this new one made battle ready with strong resistance to heat. As he looked at his assailant many thoughts ran through his head. One was here in the city. The Nomu he sent to Tamura's wouldn't last long and the attack just now would clearly alert him to where they were and what was going on. This man or cyborg whatever he was was powerful and would need his full attention to deal with. He also said he's been spying on him all day. What exactly does he know and if he's working with one he would tell him everything. As he looked at his enemy Tamura and his group suddenly came from the sludge portals, landing on the still hot ground. Gross. Hot hot hot. Tova complained as the goo from her mouth had brought her back to consciousness and the hot ground she was laying on. What the hell? Magni exclaimed, still bound. Twice had a flood of tears coming from his eyes. The pain of his broken ribs didn't hurt at all, he embraced it. I'm alive you guys! I'm real! He exclaimed as he continued to cry. Shigaraki who was still restrained looked up at the man who had saved them, however he saw another person with their hand outstretched looking to attack. Sensei? You seem to have gotten yourself in a bind, Tamira. It was one. He came out of nowhere, and I think he may have gotten Kurojiri. I am aware of that. However, that isn't the biggest issue right now, AFO said, causing the League to turn to the cyborg the boss was staring down. And who is this guy? Magni asked. Your destruction, Kenji Hikishi, Genos responded. It's Magni! He shot defensively. These words caused the villains to tense up as they were still restrained. Genos turned to the Bakugo. He was sure he could fight AFO and keep these villains in check long enough for one to show up but he needed to protect Bakugo. If he let his guard down for a moment they could warp away again and he couldn't risk that, having destroyed the hideout. Bakugo, get behind me! He ordered. Bakugo was still reeling from the shock of this situation, and the villain before him was giving him major boss vibes. That being said he didn't need some extra telling him what to do. Don't give me orders. You seem to be under the impression you're in control of this situation. His right arm enlarged as if filled with air as blackish red lighting cackled. Let me remind you how out of your league you are. He raised his hand as Genos came to meet him in a flash with a fire enhanced punch inches from his body. AFO's attack struck first as a massive blast of air that destroyed the area, sending Genos along with it, creating nothing but destruction. What a nuisance. Bakugo looked at the destruction, horrified by what the villain just did. 
AFO went on to free the members of the LOV who couldn't free themselves. Tamura stood up after freeing himself, in awe at the power of his teacher. Envious Tamura? Don't be. All of this is for you. You've gathered allies that share your cause. Keep striving towards your goal. He said charismatically. Shigurai was wide-eyed with emotion as he accepted the words of the man he respected more than anyone else. This is all well and good, but we still have that one situation to deal with, Dabi stated. No need to worry about that, Dabi. I have been pondering one for some time, and I believe I've come up with a solution. In a flash Genos was back, with a cocked back right punch. You dare to claim you can handle one? He questioned before he slammed his fist into AFO's gut. He drove the villain into the ground. How shameless! He exclaimed as he unleashed an incineration blast. One had quickly made mincemeat of the gnomus sent to the hideout. He took a quick glance at the blood and gore that covered the bar. Damn it! I knew this could happen and I still couldn't prevent it. He booked it from the bar and made it onto the street. He was about to head to where AFO was when he suddenly felt a rumble and heard the sound of roaring wind and the crashing of metal. He jumped into the air and could see the fresh trail of destruction that lined several city blocks that originated from where AFO's hideout was. Son of a bitch! One thought as he saw a streak of light dash through the destruction back towards where it originated. Way to get back up, Genos. All for one, I swear you're going to pay for that. He thought as he disappeared with Skywalk Flash Step. The villains were blown back from the force of Geno's attack. The heat from it was insane as it threatened to roast them if they got too close. Sensei! Shigaraki called out in concern. Bakugo clenched his hands. Pretty lame boss! Shigaraki turned to the ash blonde with murder in his eyes. He didn't care anymore about recruiting him. His plans had completely gone to shit and were doomed from the start thanks to one. Bakugo had refused his offer and he would have used Sensei's power to make him submit, or just kill him. The latter was now his intention as he lunged at the team. Bakugo used his explosions to get some distance as Dabi, Compress, Toga, Magni, Spinner and Twice all came at him. Genos kept his fist pressed down on AFO. Did you really think a pitiful attack like that could take me down? AFO mocked as wind circled his left, ring, middle and index fingers. He swung them and three air slashed barely cut into Genos who crossed his arms to block. The cyborg was sent into the air and landed after tanking the hit. Genos assumed a battle stance and ready to go again. He caught a quick glimpse of Bakugo trying to fend off the league, but he needed to give all his attention to AFO until one arrived. Not impressed, he said staring down AFO. Meaning? The boss responded. From that brief exchange I've figured you out. Your quirk lets you take quirks that you can keep or give to others, but with all the quirks you've stolen you haven't mastered a single one of them. You're just throwing power at your opponents. In all honesty, pretty lazy fighting. Lazy fighting that has seen the end of many foolish heroes. AFO shot back before using rivet stab. The sharp tendrils came at the cyborg whose body emitted a light before disappearing in a flash, breaking the sound barrier and leaving shockwaves where he previously stood. Genos appeared behind the villain in mid-swing. Machine gun blows! He called out as he fired hundreds of punches that pummeled AFO in the back. Genos continued his onslaught before finishing with a right punch, firing a blast from his fist that sent the villain flying forward. Bakugo was currently dodging knife swipes from Toga before blasting her with an explosion. He then dodged a lunge from Compress as Twice had made dozens of doubles and Dabi prepared to blast the blonde. Bakugo is rushed by Shigaraki and Spinner, the latter of whom swung a ninjata with the decay villain narrowly missing to grab a hold of him. There was a flash of light before a metal fist slammed into Shigaraki's right jaw, sending him flying before Spinner was nailed with a fire-enhanced spin kick breaking several of his ribs and sending him crashing into Mr. Compress. Genos raised his left hand and fired an incineration blast that countered Dobby's flames in a burst of fire and heat. Several of Twice's doubles were destroyed in their clash. Genos looked into the blaze. I'll keep them busy. You get out of here and get to the police. He ordered Bakugo, 
not turning to look at him. Bakugo grit his teeth, ready to give a retort when Genos crossed his arms and bladed sprung from his forearms. Don't you dare argue! Stop being an idiot and go! Bakugo swallowed his pride and with a powerful explosion blasted away from the battlefield, he fired another explosion and got farther away when he was suddenly enveloped in the same gray goo from earlier, and the next thing he knew there was a vice-like grip around his face. To his horror he was in the grasp of the boss villain, a look of fear was prevalent on his face as this man made him feel and see his own death. You didn't think you could just walk out of here did you? While you may no longer be of interest to Tamira, your explosion quirk is rather impressive. His hand began to glow with a red aura. I'll make good use of it. Upon hearing these words and feeling strange, Bakugo pushed past his fear and tried to blast the villain only for no explosion to happen with his hand only slapping his mask. He couldn't describe what was happening to him, but he didn't like it, and the worst of it was he couldn't do anything about it. For the first time in his life he felt true, unadulterated fear. AFO seemed distracted for a moment as he began to turn his head left when once right foot connected with his mask, shattering it. I'm gonna need you to let him go. All for one. The hero had attacked him with a flying kick that created a massive shockwave and forced him to drop Bakugo. The momentum and power behind his kick carried the two across the battlefield before one kicked off his face, sending the villain tearing through the ground. One flips in the air, correcting himself as he lands, he turns back to the ash blonde who was on the ground still shaken up. You okay, Bakugo? He asked, genuinely concerned. The teen in question was on all fours as he tried to collect himself. The words of him taking his quirk were fresh in his mind. Instinctively, he made several small explosions in his right palm. He sighed in relief at still having his quirk. He clenched his fist. Yeah, I'm okay. He answered. Good. One said as he looked around. He could feel the life all around him. Many people were injured in AFO's attack and needed help. He didn't blame Genos for this but for this much destruction to occur so suddenly really hammered home how dangerous AFO was. He turned to the cyborg who had finished slashing twice doubles and was holding the duplicating villain up by the face. Genos, I can leave them to you right? Of course. He answers before tossing twice at a reaching compress who accidentally used his quirk on his comrade. Before he could correct his mistake Geno snapped his right arm before bringing the villain's head down on his knee, breaking his mask, and several bones in his face. He then pressed a hand to the villain's chest and hit him with a point-blank blast that sent him back. He then speed blitzed and decked Dobby with a left hook and began to wail on the villain's patchwork face like a punching bag. One turned back to AFO who was picking himself off the ground. His mask had been destroyed by that one attack and it revealed his hairless, eyeless and noseless potato head. As the villain turned to him one could sense the anger, malice and fear within the villain. As he fully stood up he put on an obviously fake smile. Well well well, the corkless wonder finally makes his entrance. Bakugo heard these words and his wide eyes locked onto the green clad hero. One stared down his enemy and began to walk towards him. With the mess you've made around here I thought it prudent to make an appropriate entrance just for you. AFO smiled. I'm curious. Just how long have you been on to us? What does that matter? All that matters is that Shigaraki's not very observant, and I'm right where I plan to be. Having you cornered. And ending this. His tone was serious as he closed the distance between the two. AFO chuckled as he raised a hand theatrically. Ending this you say. You ignorant child. If you believe defeating me will solve anything you are sadly mistaken. If anything this world will become worse off without me. Oh please. You and I both know you don't care about the world or people. Everything you do is for your own damn self. And what's wrong with that? He said calmly. My power has done nothing but restore order to a damaged world. Human beings are not the most intelligent of creatures. When there is chaos and they live in despair, they seek for one to lead them. To guide them to the better world they envision for themselves. That's all I've ever done, one. There have been those who could never understand that, and heed such progress. 
but all if does is lead to meaningless suffering, death, and discrimination. Like your brother? One stated. AFO's smile wavered as he knew what this meant. All Mike told you about one for all, didn't he? And then some. Is that how a sick brain like your gets its kicks? By planning the death of innocent people? You misunderstand. I have never once planned the death of innocent people. However, I find the prospect of coming up with a plan to a goal with multiple paths that will trigger a series of events that will allow me to achieve said goal to be most enjoyable. It's just that the deaths of innocent people are inevitable, but it's never about them. He answered casually. One clenched fist. And with that I'm done listening to you. AFO's right arm bloated as he aimed at one. Strange, because I'm not finished talking. There was a loud explosion of air pressure that blew away Bakugo and most of the LOV. When the air died down Geno spotted one with his left fist raised and AFO missing most of his right arm as it was completely destroyed at the elbow. The news chopper was flying above and shined a light on the two combatants. AFO was horrified by the sudden destruction of his arm. Before he could fully register it one rose up, shoving his right fist into the villain's chin, uppercutting him into the sky and leaving shockwaves in his wake. The villain got above the clouds before he was able to stop himself. His arm was slowly regenerating but the pain of that hit was intense. He tried to sense for one, using Moonwalk to float, he descended below the clouds. AFO was on edge, he knew one was somewhere. With his speed he certainly wouldn't see him coming. Come out one, I know you're there. He thought aloud on edge. In a flash the hero appeared in his face with right fist cocked back. You say that like I was hiding. One said as he throws a punch that gets around AFO's block and connects with his face. The villain granted in pain as he was sent flying across the sky. One appeared behind him and nailed him with a left spin kick to the back. AFO bounced across the sky like a pinball as one battered him all over the place. One kneed the villain in the left side of the head. As he flew forward one appeared in front of him again in mid-swing only for his fist to be caught. AFO gripped the hero's fist. An unamused look was discernible as he spoke. A little advice, boy. Using his free hand he quickly pressed it into the hero's face and released a burst of purple fire. Don't press your luck. The attack was so large and bright it could be seen from the ground. One was engulfed by the purple flame. AFO felt his arms be grabbed before the hero emerged from the flames unharmed and brought his feet to the villain's chest. Never even knew I had it. One exclaimed as with a powerful kick he sent AFO flying as well as removing both his arms from his body at the bicep. AFO's blood spews as he flies back. One drops the arms and flips to correct himself. He kicks off the air and meets the armless villain in an instant before pummeling him with fiery fists. Waves of blaze! He called out as he wailed on his burning punching bag across the sky. The sound of each punch echoed as with one final punch he sent AFO's burning body towards the ground where the fight started. The pounding of one's attack and the fire made it difficult for AFO's regeneration quirk to keep up. He hasn't been in this much pain since his fight with All Might. No, this was far greater. I can't keep taking hits like this. If I don't do something, one of these punches may kill me. My battle with All Might didn't hurt this much, and I can tell he's not even going all out. Good, I still have a gambit to play. He thought as his body hit the ground, cracking it, creating a large crater and causing it to rumble. The flames engulfing AFO burned out, and his body was badly beaten as he laid motionless in the crater. One landed, seeing that Genos had laid waste to the LOV and each of them were down, the two nodded at each other. He approached the down AFO, he was clearly faking it and his arms were slowly regenerating. You wanna cut the crap now? I know you're not unconscious. He clenched a fist and released a wave of power aura that shook the ground and sent chills down AFO's spine and the eminent feeling of death washed over him. I won't kill you. But a monster like you is going to remember who and what beat you. AFO chuckled in his crater, buying time for at least one of his hands to regenerate. You won't kill me? That's very interesting coming from you. I'm fairly certain the bar in Tamira's place looks like a murder scene right now. 6. 
You murdered six people and that was only recently. What about back in Hosu? For a hero you have a copious amount of blood on your hands. One of his arms was restored allowing him to lift himself back up. He had a new aura of confidence that didn't go unnoticed by one. This coming from the man who rips people's humanity to pieces? It's blatantly clear the Nomu are nothing more than things. To you, I've made my peace with having to kill them, because Dash. He raised his right hand and clenched his fist as he released a wave of power aura. It just means I have to take it all out on you, the lives you've ruined, the people you've hurt, broken, manipulated and discarded without a single shred of decency or mercy. He assumed his stance, ready to attack. I'm that one person in this society you can't do that to. He gave the villain a confident smile that scared him at his core. This genetic failure is about to become your worst nightmare. The pressure he was emitting bared down on the villain who extended a hand as if clenching something, his smile unwavering. A breeze passed over the battlefield as one speed blitzed his opponent and threw a punch intended to nail him. To his surprise, AFO disappeared in a flash with his punch missing. He sensed the villain behind him. Interesting. No power at all and yet so powerful. Let me guess, you're one of those fools who believe that hard work and training would make up for your lack of a quirk. AFO asked casually. One turned, jumped, and spin kicked him. AFO blocked the kick, quickly grabbed his leg before tossing him through several buildings. AFO watched as one dug himself out of the pile of metal, his left hand still outstretched. You're living in a lost reality. I told my foolish younger brother years ago, reality is no longer playing by the rules. Surely you of all people understand that. He questioned before firing another blast of air from his regenerated right hand. One, sensing the people near him quickly throws a punch that creates a blast of air pressure. The two attacks collide. The air cannons shake up the area even more before AFOs is overwhelmed by once and is blasted back. One speed blitz the villain, ready to throw a right punch. AFO threw a left to counter with his hand breaking against one's fist. Is all you know how to do is play mind games when you can't physically overcome someone? One asked as his right fist connected with AFO's gut, leaving an imprint and sending him flying. AFO gripped his stomach. The pain coursing through him was intense. This hero was becoming more and more frustrating by the second. His body couldn't keep this up and one wouldn't let his guard down for anything. There wasn't a single weakness to exploit. He was angry, truly angry. Everything about this quirkless anomaly made no sense. His brain was firing on all cylinders but not a single idea to get out of this situation was feasible. Tamura and his group were down. He above all else needed to get away. His entire plan depended on it. Even if he could make an opening there was no way he and Tamura were escaping both one and Genos, not without Kirojiri. He was on his last legs, and then it hit him. He needed to make the full use of the quirks he has, that should injure one enough for him to plan ahead. AFO hit the ground hard and one stared him down. I don't have a quirk for you to steal. Being born without power doesn't make you powerless. One chuckled. You're not that special. Hell, you're actually lucky. If my masters were here, you'd be dead by now. He looked at the villain who was slow to get back up. All Might did a number on you, didn't he? I take it that the mask I smashed earlier was keeping you alive to an extent? AFO picked himself off the ground, hand outstretched as his body emitted a dark blue aura and his muscles enlarged. You're not wrong. This body is far past its expiration date, but that doesn't mean it doesn't still have its uses. He clenched his fists. I came across a very useful quirk recently. Physical Snatch. It lets me steal the physical abilities of another like speed, endurance, and power. One then noted of the times his hand was outstretched as if grabbing something. Strange, you've been siphoning off my speed and strength, but I haven't felt it at all. AFO disappeared in mid-swing behind one. That's the thrill. Just how bottomless is your power? He exclaimed as he threw a punch that went right through one's head. That's between me, myself, and I. One answered as he appeared above the villain in mid-kick before decking him with a triple kick that sent him sprawling across the ground, 
AFO coughed up blood as he struggled to pick himself up. Those kicks nearly broke his neck. Genos watched this fight from a distance. AFO was on his last legs and this was almost over. He had beaten down the LOV. All of them were battered, broken and unconscious. This was too easy all things considered. Thankfully he didn't kill a single one of them but numerous broken bones and traumatic brain damage would make up for it. His scanners picked up a disturbance, and he saw a black mist appeared before him. Master! Kurojiri called out, his yellow eyes visible as he appeared on the battlefield. AFO sensed the black mist. This was the out he was hoping for. Kurojiri! Save Tamura and his allies! One rushed AFO. Genos! Stop him! He ordered before kicking AFO in the stomach, launching him into the air. One leaped into the air after the villain. Genos was already on it. His scanners had spotted the villain's neck brace and in a flash of speed he honed in on it. He was within gripping distance of the brace when a portal appeared before him and Genos was going so fast he could stop himself from passing through it. Damn it! He cursed the situation as he disappeared into the blackness. Genos? One said with concern as he sensed his partner disappear. You shouldn't let your guard down, one. AFO declared as he extended a hand and black red lightning cackled. The hero could sense the attack coming at him was not only to kill, but powerful. It wasn't ideal as he wasn't high enough, but he had chose to use that technique. Forming his hands into the hand sign he used it. Roaring Tiger Smash. He called as there was an eruption of dark red electric energy. His blast of air with the head of a tiger collided with the energy. The dark red electricity grew into a massive ball of energy, seemingly overwhelming the blast of air. There was the roar of a tiger before there was a massive explosion of air that completely overwhelmed AFO's attack, blasting him with a focused blast of compressed air that created a massive dome of air above the city. All who saw this from below were in awe as the two figures at the center of this clash fell from the sky. One fell gracefully while the other fell like a dead fish. One landed gently while AFO created a crater, with every bone in his body aching in pain. He had trouble just clenching his fists, his entire body was in agony, and his regeneration quirk didn't ease the pain at all. The physical abilities he'd stolen from one were leaving him, and for the first time in his life he was feeling true inadequacy. A useless, quirkless nobody was humiliating him like this. This wasn't happening? Something like this shouldn't even be possible. Despite his physical snatch quirk, there was a limit to how much he could steal. His physical abilities were greater than they've ever been but one didn't even notice. This was his worst nightmare, someone truly powerful without a quirk he could steal. It was so upsetting he was on the verge of hyperventilating. Kurojiri had gotten Tamura and the others away but he was sure one would track them and arrest them. All the years he'd been walking this earth and it was a quirkless person that did him in. Not possible. But the indescribable pain coursing through him right now was very real. He honestly preferred All Might right now, as he could at least emotionally manipulate and torment him before killing him. But he couldn't do that to one. Still, he had his pride. He was all for one. The demon king that ruled Japan from the shadows. He picked himself up. The news chopper shined a light on them, he grit his teeth in anger as he combined spring-like limbs, multiplayer X4, hypertrophy, kinetic booster, and several strength-enhancing quirks on top of him still having the strength and speed he's stolen from one. His body emitted the same dark blue aura as his right arm formed into a giant monstrosity of quirks, ready to end this one way or another. You're just a quirkless nobody who comes from who knows where. He lunged at the hero. You can't beat me. Do you have any idea who I am? He roared as he threw his massive arm at the hero. One raised his left hand, stopping the fist instantly with ease, creating a shockwave and shocking AFO. I don't give a damn who you are because it doesn't matter. His head was lowered as he spoke before rising up. Whoever you are, I will beat you. He declared as he brought up his left foot and a high kick sent him upward. AFO spit up more blood from the hit as he flew higher and higher. One leaped into the air after him, 
fist cocked back ready to put him down for good. Will you just fall already? AFO yelled. It wouldn't do any good. No matter how hard you push. I won't be thrown to the ground, so give up. I'm trying to make me give up. He threw a punch that carried a mighty cannon of air with it that blasted AFO. The blast of air bombarded AFO, launching him higher into the air. In a flash of speed one appeared above the rising villain and fired another powerful blast of air, trapping him in between the one that was already beating him. One continued to fire shockwaves of air until AFO was trapped in the center of intersecting blasts of air that pummeled him from all directions. Roaring Sky Barrage! The pain the villain was withstanding at this moment was indescribable as he felt a blow in his back. This was one driving his fist into the villain and back to the ground. AFO felt every bone in his body break as he plummeted back to earth, creating a massive creator that shook the ground where the pain overtook him and he lost consciousness. One stood triumphant as he raised a fist in the air and the news chopper shined down on him. The battle was won, and great evil had been defeated, and it was time to pick up the pieces. Many heroes had already arrived on the scene and were already helping any injured people. When one joined and everything sped up significantly, surprisingly there were no casualties but many were injured and needed medical attention. When one arrived on the scene the cleanup went smoothly and efficiently. He still couldn't get over how no one died in the attack, he was grateful nonetheless. He had gotten in touch with Genos, apparently Kuro Jairi had sent him to the training camp and in thanks to Vlad King's idiocy he was able to get away. Fortunately the villains he left behind were arrested, and he was on his way back. AFO was arrested and loaded up into the villain transport, and would be in Tartarus by tomorrow. Unfortunately the last spy fly that was on Dobby was destroyed, for the moment he's lost the LOV, but with AFO away he took that as a much greater victory. To no one's surprise Bakugo didn't leave the battlefield and go to the police, he was a witness to once fight with AFO. Thanks to the other heroes he was able to get the team to the police and come back to help the civilians. As they walked the steps to the station the blonde refused to enter the building. Stop being stubborn Bakugo, just go in there and let them know of the situation. I promise they'll help you. The ash blonde looked at the hero with a look that was a mix of confusion and anger. Deku, is that you? He asked, completely serious. Excuse me? He responded still in his hero voice. As Bakugo looked at him he noted the similarities between the independent hero and the nerd he hated so much. They were around the same height, worked in the same city he grew up in, practiced martial arts just like Deku did, and was apparently quirkless. Deku being the only person he knew that was. It's also the fact that he's an independent hero, he can't use a quirk and has to rely on his physical abilities. A useless person without power saved him from the strongest villain he had ever seen. His brain was racking as when the boss villain called him the Quirkless Wonder, his mind instantly shifted to Deku. A quirkless loser who Yui wouldn't even let take their entrance exam because it would be a waste of time. If you're not who I think you are then take off the mask, he demanded. He's putting the pieces together, one thought as he registered his words. He may not look it but Bakugo was a pretty perceptive person, which is why he adamantly avoided interacting with him as one, he was sure he'd figure out his identity. Still, he didn't want him to know. Their relationship was so screwed up at this point, forget being friends, any chance of being civil was out of the question thanks to Bakugo's personality. Until he changes, even a little, it's not possible. You're welcome to think what you want but I can't remove my mask for obvious reasons. Bakugo clenched his fists. Deku, I swear if that's you under that mask, he said in a low growl. I don't know who this, Deku, is, but I recommend you do some self-reflection. After all, there was a reason the villains wanted to recruit you, he said before disappearing in a flash, going back to help the civilians and leaving the ash blonde shocked with gritted teeth. In an undisclosed location the members of the League of Villains lay sprawled unconscious on the were in a wide, dimly lit corridor. Each and every one of them were battered, beaten and burned with multiple broken bones. 
Kurojiri had brought them to the safest place he could think of. His was sure the master had been defeated by one and was determined to obey his final order. As he checked on the injured Tamura he heard the sound of footsteps around the corner from where they were. The one responsible for the steps came into view. She was wearing a red tank top and black yoga pants with red sneakers. Her ash-colored hair was in a ponytail and a fringe covered her right eye. Her left, visible one was green and she had a look of annoyance when her sight landed on the group. Last I checked I was done babysitting the man-child. I know this isn't ideal, but please help them Tachibana, the black mist pleaded. The woman looked down at the beaten villains. They had clearly seen better days. Just from a quick glance she could tell their injuries were serious. While normally she wouldn't do anything for these people unless she was being paid, she quickly understood why they were brought to her. Gail Breeze had called in and reported a while ago, he should be back soon, at least they got the upfront payment. She sighed. So, that finally happened, huh? Yes, it seems the master was defeated. By one, right? Yes. Tachibana smiled. Pick up that phone, because I fucking called it. She cheered as she lifted Toga and Compress. Grab the others and follow me. And full disclosure, this is not your new hideout. You lot are resting up, then you're getting the fuck out. Am I clear? She asked with a wave of power aura that shook Kurojiri to his core. Why yes ma'am. He stuttered fearfully. They collected the injured LOV and made their way through the corridor. As they went on their way Tachibana had a small smile as she thought about what led them here. Beating AFO huh? Way to go Izuku. Good to know you haven't changed a bit. Wish I could say the same. Chapter 27 The Hero's Problems and His Responsibility At the mountain lodge of the wild wild pussycats a car pulls up to the scene. Out steps Katsuki Bakugo accompanied by two police officers. The other students had begun training as they were met by Eraserhead at the entrance. The look on Bakugo's face was telling. Though he had to spend the night in the precinct, was kidnapped by villains and almost had his quirk taken, that wasn't what angered him. The fact that one, no Deku, had saved him, and not only that he'd been so far ahead and been looking down on him all these years. How far had the nerd climbed, and how had he not noticed? He also remembered when he was easily knocked out by one a few days ago, and the fact that Deku was there after he left, infuriated him for not seeing the obvious signs. Welcome back, Bakugo. Eraser welcomed his student. Yeah, good morning, where's everybody else? He asked, seriously and aggressively. They've already begun training for the day. In spite of the situation last night it was decided not to end the training camp. Good. He growled as he angrily walked past his teacher straight to the training ground. Eraser turned to his student whose back was to him as he kept going. Wait, don't you want to change or at least take a bath or something? Hell no! He yelled. He's completely shrugged it off and only cares about he's just fine. Eraser had thought as he turned to the officers, bowing his head. Thank you for returning my student. It's no trouble. However, we have questions for you, one of the officers said. Eraser kept his expression. He knew this was coming. He answered questions to the police last night when the villains were taken away. That was until Vlad let the warped villain get away. It was both their faults actually. He turned his back and he opened a portal under Vlad. Fortunately, he only sent him to the woods a few kilometers out, but the fact he made Vlad lose his grip on him and get away does not look good on them. The Kamino incident was all over the news the next morning. The destruction caused by the villain responsible was a point that everyone reporting on it was making. The news chopper that had been flying above had filmed the entire fight, with those at home glued to the screens who saw it real time. It was reported of how one and an unknown hero battled the League of Villains and their leader. The footage showed how Genos was wiping the floor with the League and once battle with AFO that went from the air to the ground. They didn't have a name for the villain and every media outlet had something to say about this, most notably a claim made by the boss villain about one. The Midoriya Residence Izuka had got home late last night, he had found Ari in his bed when he got home, 
he put on his PJs and went to sleep with her. The next morning when he woke up she was gone, he got up, left his room and found both Ari and his mom chilling in the living room. Good morning you too. Good morning Izuku. His mother responded. Good morning Izani, Ari said. He turned to face the TV and to his surprise it was the news show with Fujioka, Katakuri and Yugo. Izuka locked his eyes on the TV when he saw that they were talking about the incident last night in Kamino. The camera zoomed in on Fujioka. Good morning everyone coming to you live this morning from all of us here in the studio. An awful lot has happened in the past 24 hours. The situation in Kamino last night was devastating. Thankfully there were no casualties but that's not what everyone is taking away from this. Let's roll the clip. The screen then showed the news chopper's footage that filmed his battle with AFO. It started with his roaring tiger smash obliterating AFO's dark eclectic blast. The entire chopper shook from the blast as it was almost knocked out of the sky from the wind pressure. Thankfully it was still able to record the fight. The light shined on them as AFO's body morphed into a monstrous combination of quirks. The audio was able to pick up both he and the villain's words in the next moments. You're just a quirkless nobody who comes from who knows where. He lunged at the hero. You can't beat me. Do you have any idea who I am? He roared as he lunged at one who stopped his fist with one hand. I don't give a damn who you are because it doesn't matter. Whoever you are I will beat you. One kicked the villain into the air and the camera was able to record his final attack before showing the end of the fight. The camera panned back to the reporters at the desk. An incredible fight that happened in Kamino last night. You heard it here folks, the one and only independent hero one is quirkless. Thoughts? Fujioka asked as she turned to her co-workers. Yugo was the first to respond. Seeing how this is coming from a villain you would naturally take this with a grain of salt. However, when you actually think about it it does make sense. I'll be honest I've had that suspicion since we reported that he became independent. And if you've noticed literally nothing's changed from his days as a vigilante. He uses the same abilities and the same moves. I don't know how it's possible, but to hear him say it, it's only martial arts. That was the explanation he gave for when he stopped that bear in Chiba a while back and when he put out a fire here in town. Saying that out loud sounds weird but this has been his explanation every time he's called out when as an independent hero he's only allowed to use his physical abilities. All eyes landed on Katakuri, once biggest critic. The eldest person at the table had a look that seemed neutral but his body language was telling a different story. He was watching the news coverage of the incident in real time last night, and he couldn't wait to tear into the hero this morning. But the villain's words of one being quirkless completely stunned him. When they first reported that one had become the country's first independent hero he was adamant about the entire concept of independence being a joke. Something that was never meant to be taken seriously as it was the exact opposite of being a respected professional. He was old school believing in the traditional and honorable way of doing things. As far as he was concerned there was a right and wrong way of going about being a hero, and one was the very definition of the wrong way of being a hero. Though he would never admit it, one was a hero in every way that mattered, someone who has saved millions and doesn't deal with the media or politics. Still, one not operating within the established regulations for heroes is not a good thing. One, he takes away work from honest heroes trying to make a living and while some make the argument that heroes should not be paid, the fact that they are and the dangers that come with it make it an honorable profession. One, when a vigilante comes on the scene, one as good as one, that puts a dent in people's livelihoods. Two, vigilantes set a bad precedent in thinking they can do whatever they want with no consequences. They have people who are specifically trained to be heroes. Nothing wrong with being a good Samaritan, but people dressing up and conducting hero operations on their own with no credentials just so they can play hero is not a good look. And third and finally, his quirk. Allowing people to use their quirks any and however way they want is something that cannot be condoned. Especially with one as powerful as once. Even if he uses it for good, the fact of the matter is he has either the right or the approval to do that. 
And the worst of it is that he's become so influential that young children who look up to him will definitely want to follow his path. He had listened to every point Hugo had made just now, and the possibility of him being quirkless never occurred to him. If he were then that would mean for the past year, and some change he's been bashing a quirkless person, after all he said no way one could be quirkless. If it came to light that one was truly quirkless the backlash for him would be outrageous so he couldn't afford for this to be true. Katakuri faced his co-workers. I think that this may be one of if not the biggest red herrings I've ever heard. The camera panned to him as he spoke with both his co-workers looking at him unsurprised. Are we seriously going to sit around this table and go on about one being quirkless like that makes any sense at all? Let's say for a moment I entertain that idea. I take that back because I'm not going to entertain that idea. We're going to take the words of a villain and just run with it. How would he even know that anyway? Yugo answered. Can't answer that second question, but a boss villain with multiple quirks gets effortlessly beat down by a quirkless hero. I'd be angry too. Maybe this isn't their first encounter, that's the impression I got. Same. Fujioka chimed in. I've had the one is quirkless theory for a while now and if this confirms it it answers a lot of things. She said with a sexy, sly smile. Such as? Katakuri asked. The biggest question I think this answers is why he became a vigilante in the first place. Think about it, can you name a school in the Hero Academia that has ever accepted a quirkless applicant? Katakuri answered. No, because you can't be a hero without a quirk. No prudent administration would allow that, it's just common sense. And here we have a supposedly quirkless hero who can do all these incredible things and it's just physical prowess. Maybe, just maybe, he tried to go the hero route but was denied because he didn't have a quirk. The older man narrowed his eyes. I'd tread carefully if I were you Fujioka because it sounds like you're accusing these respected institutions of discrimination. I'm not accusing anyone of anything. But it's common knowledge how one feels about pros and the hero system in general, that had to have originated from somewhere. Plus I have a very reliable source of where one could have learned martial arts from. These words got the attention of both men. Interesting. And did this source give a name for one? Hugo asked with a smile. It did. But I can't deny or confirm that it's true. However, with all the available information it stands to reason that one is quirkless. We've talked about him countless times on this show. Some of his auctions we approve of, some we don't. But it's interesting to see what will happen from here because it's an example of anything is possible. Dot. She turned to the camera. One, if you're watching this let's have a one-on-one -on -one sit down. I'm a fan, and this would give you a chance to clear the air. Izuka looked at the woman's yellow eyes through the TV screen as he pondered her request. The camera then turned to Katakuri who had a small smile. Oh you're playing that game? No, one if you're watching this then come on the show, if you're the hero you claim to be then come on here and clear the air, because my opinion hasn't changed. Fact, the UA first years were at a training camp when the LOV attacked and kidnapped a student last night. One was there knew they were coming and still let that happen. Katakuri, you're too hung up on minor details. You can't put that on one, that's entirely on Yue for not being more meticulous. Plus one captured four villains albeit one was able to get away he was still able to handle the situation and get that kidnapped student to the police. Not a single person died last night, and what was destroyed can quickly be rebuilt. But who I'm most curious about is that cyborg. This is the second time he's shown up, both times it was in connection to one. He was at the storm and he was in Kamino last night. What's his story? Thoughts for later I guess. We've got more on the hour after the break, see you in a bit. Fujioko said as the camera panned off the set they went to commercial. Izuka stood as all the things just said all came together in his mind. He could feel his mother's eyes on him with a look of concern and Eri had gone to her room. He then pulled out his phone and opened the app. He went to the community section in true to form, since 7 o'clock people had been asking questions about him being quirkless and having discussions amongst each other about it. Many were in disbelief, 
not believing it while others were being logical and pointing out all the obvious evidence they all ignored. As he read the various comments he was surprised at how supportive a lot of it was, with several people admitting that they themselves were quirkless and gave up on being a hero or had a quirkless friend or relative. He continued to read the comments when he heard the gentle voice of his mother call out to him. Izuku? The son turned to his mother who had a look of concern. Are you alright? He sighed. I knew this day would come. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't a little concerned of what might happen when I revealed the truth. Will you take off the mask? I'll cross that bridge when or if I get to it. In the meantime I have to go speak with the masters. He said as he turned from his mom and went to shower and get dressed. He put on a black tank top under an unbuttoned black, gray and red checkered dress shirt with rolled up sleeves, black shorts, low top socks and his red shoes. Upon exiting his room he found his mom making breakfast. Once the food was prepared the three sat down to eat. Izuka quickly finished and got up to leave the apartment before promising Eri to take her to the park this afternoon. Izuka made his way to Rising Sky. On the way he passed an electronics store with TVs in the front of the store that were showing the Kamino incident and the outlets reporting on it. As he went he could hear the conversations of people discussing whether or not he was quirkless as well as the Kamino incident and speculating about AFO. He kept his head up as he made it to the dojo and went inside. He saw Rumi, Kiyuki and Saki training together as Michiko watched from the porch. The three females were blurs as they traded blows across the courtyard all wearing G.I.s. Rumi spin kicked Saki who blocked with her left forearm. The blow sends her skidding back. Rumi shifts her body left and dodges a strike from Kiyuki before grabbing her arm and going for a knee to her stomach. The younger girl quickly jumps, avoiding the knee and swings her left foot to kick Rumi in the side of her head. The rabbit woman jumps back as she's forced to let go. Before Kiyuki could react, Saki was on her, unleashing a flurry of punches. She's able to dodge and block most of them but a heavy one gets around her guard, hitting her face and allowing Saki to land an uppercut to the chin that brings her off the ground. In that same instant Kiyuki is able to bring up her foot to kick Saki's chin only for her friend to lean back and barely dodge. Saki quickly throws a spinning back fist to her right as she sends Rumi there only for her to miss as the woman had dropped before sweeping her legs. Saki hit the ground hard as Rumi flipped over her and launched at Kiyuki who just landed. Izuku didn't make a sound as he approached the women. Michiko turned to him, a mischievous smile on her face. Hey! Good morning Izuku! The training women stopped what they were doing and their eyes fell on the approaching greenette. Izuka suddenly tensed up as he could sense their fighting spirit and after the morning he's had he could use some entertainment like this. He smiled as he took his stance and with his right hand he gestured to them to bring it on. Rumi, Kiyuki and Saki had excited looks as their eyes were akin to three lionesses who had found a new toy to play with. Michiko looked down at the girls, her smile on full display. Get him! The three girls were on him in a flash of speed. Saki and Kiyuki were on his left and right side in mid-swing. With skillful technique Izuku deflected both girls' fists causing them to intersect and in that same motion slammed back fists into both of their stomachs sending them both back. Rumi brought down an axe kick to Izuku's head only for her foot to crack the ground, using her senses she spin kicked right, sending a horizontal air slash at Izuku who launched a vertical one of his own. The two blades of air collided and cancelled each other out. Saki rushed him and unleashed a barrage of punches he skillfully deflected before punching her in the face twice and kicking her away. As she stumbled back he dodges a strike from behind by Kiyuki. He grabs her arm, decks her left side before nailing her with a palm strike and tossing her into Saki. He flips over Rumi who attempted to kick him. Before he could land the rabbit woman was on him landing a kick that Izuka blocks with his left forearm, the hit sending him to the side. Rumi kicks off the ground and in a flash she attacks Izuka with a flying kick that he sidesteps to dodge. She gets her footing and throws a blurring series of kicks that causes the air to swirl. Izuka dodges as she chases him around with none of her kicks connecting. Izuka senses a presence and flips as Saki gets behind him to attack. 
Using her arm as a vault, he shifts his body to knee her in the head, but before he could connect, Rumi kicks him into the air. As he rises up, he sees Kiyuki above him. Their fists collide in the air, and they trade blows as they fall back to earth. They get close to the ground with either getting an edge on the other, and with a powerful clash of kicks they separate and land. The women regroup and Izuka readies himself for another round. You three have definitely gotten stronger. And you're just as good as ever, Kiyuki said with an excited smile. Practice does make perfect, Kiyuki. True enough. But I don't care how good you are, you're going down today, Izuku. She said with fiery determination as she assumed her stance. Rumi had a fiery smile. I was about to say the same thing. Saki cracked her knuckles. Time for round two. Strongest disciple. Dot. Izuka smirked confidently. I'm right here. All four fighters disappeared in a flash of speed as they resumed their training. At UA High. Nizu was sitting at his desk. A phone to his ear as he spoke with the eraser head. I see. So Bakugo was returned to the camp safely then? Yeah. He immediately went to train with the others when he got back and doesn't seem to have any injuries. That's a relief. The media is all over the incident in Kamino last night, and we'll have to take the heat for allowing one of our students to be kidnapped, but we can get through it. All things considered, the situation could have been much worse. That's true. The villains one captured were taken into custody, two of which were violent murderers and the third one was some messed up middle school kid with a dangerous gas quirk. Is that so? Well I am interested to hear how the warp villain got away. As I recall he was one of the villains one captured but he somehow escaped. He raised her head sighed. There's no excuse. We had him and he was able to slip away. It can't be helped. It's in the past now. This latest incident has made me consider a plan I've been mulling over for a while now. I'll discuss the details with the staff when you all return from camp. All right, talk to you later, the pro said before hanging up. The call ended and Niza sat in silence as he knew he'd have to address the media soon. He then dialed another number and after a few rings he picked up. Hello, Principal Nizu. All Might answered. Hello, All Might. I was just calling to check on how you're doing. I assume you know all about the incident last night in Kamino? All Might deadpanned on the other side of the phone. Yes, I saw. To think all for one would make a move. While all that was going on, I was enjoying a nice relaxing bath. Niza lightly chuckled. Well, I'm glad to hear you're enjoying your time off. I know how important it is to you, so I hope you'll forgive me for trusting everything to one. The number one hero took in his words knowing what they meant. So you knew something like this would happen. All I knew is that one claimed to be in control of the situation. He had information none of us were able to uncover so when Eraserhead told me he had come to the camp to intercept the League's impending attack I chose to trust him to deal with it. It may have gotten out of hand but things seemed to turn out alright for the most part. That's a relief and now AFO can rot in a cell for the rest of his life like he deserves. All Might stated confidently. While we're still on the subject of him, I'm not sure if you're aware but he may have revealed once statues to the world. What do you mean? I mean that in the footage of the fight AFO angrily called one a corkless nobody. Multiple outlets have that footage and are running with it. What I'm trying to say is that it's only a matter of time before his identity and truth are revealed and everything that's led up till now, including how we treated him. That's right, Niza said solemnly. I haven't forgotten what you said that day, Niza. It'll be difficult, but I believe we can right those wrongs. The Chimera smiled. You're right. The first step is always the hardest, but it's the most important. In hindsight, we could have handled the other day better, but let's try to stay positive. On a final note, we'll be having a meeting once the training camp has concluded. He hung up the phone and stared out to his office. He thought of what AFO said in his final clash with one when he called him a corkless nobody. Niza leaned back as he calmly sipped his tea. Is that how we made you feel, Midoriya? Might Tower's penthouse. 
All Might had exited his room and walked into the living room to see Melissa sitting on the couch, sipping coffee and watching the news. The channel she was watching was reporting on the Camino incident. It spoke about the destruction but no casualties while playing the live coverage of the cleanup and getting the public's opinion. Good morning, Melissa. Morning, Uncle Mike. I made coffee. She answered, raising her cup. Thank you. I could use a cup. He went into the kitchen to make himself a cup of coffee. Melissa took a sip as she prepared to ask him a question. Hey, Uncle Mike, you know about this situation last night, right? You mean the situation in Camino? Yeah, I heard. Thankfully, no one was killed. Yeah, thank goodness for that. But I was asking more about one. All Might had an uneasy look as he was sure where she was going with this. He was aware she met one in Midoriya at I Island and that she too was quirkless. Is that so? What about him? Well, it's just that. A lot of the news outlets and even people on his app are saying he might be quirkless. You know him right. Is there any truth to that? All might pause for a moment as he thought about how to answer. It wasn't his secret to tell but Midoriya and Melissa were friends. They did hang out on his birthday. Also it would mean a lot to her if she knew someone like her was a hero despite the societal stigma against it. Using a spoon All Might mixed his cream and sugar in his coffee. I wouldn't say I know him just of him. And to him being quirkless, I can't really say. In a world full of anomalies he stands in a league of his own. He said before taking a sip of coffee. That sounds like you may think so but you're unsure. As I said I can't say. The only one who can answer that is one. Melissa accepted his answer before changing the channel. All Might sat on the couch next to her. So, any plans for today, Melissa? He asked with a smile. I was gonna hang out with Fujiwara today. He said I could come see his lab and everything. She answered happily. That sounds fun. It is. The Fujiwara Laboratory. I can hardly imagine it. What most scientists would consider a groundbreaking invention, the Fujiwaras call it a Wednesday project. Wow, they seem pretty impressive. They are. I really want to learn as much as I can from them, Melissa said with a smile. All Might looked at the girl. He was happy to see her smile like that again. It hasn't been easy for her since Dave was incarcerated, and she's slowly getting back a sense of normality. He was happy about that as the girl still had a bright future ahead of her, and he would do all he could to support her. So what are you doing today, Uncle Might? Melissa's voice brought him out of his thoughts. Oh, I think I'll train with young Togata today at UA. Melissa finished her coffee. Cool. I'm gonna take a shower and get dressed. She got up and left the room leaving a content all might sitting on the couch. A phone call is here. A phone call is here. All Might picked up his phone to see he was getting a call from Sir Night Eye. He almost didn't want to answer but this was something that couldn't be avoided. At the training camp. All of the students were hard at work training, pushing themselves to be plus ultra. It was day three of the training camp and though everyone was aware of yesterday's events they quickly moved past it. Every person on the field was hard at work training but one person in particular seemed to be in his own world. Bakugo plunged his hands into boiling water, pulled them out and unleashed a massive explosion. He did this countless times yesterday but today was different. He had a look of anger that went far beyond his normal expression and his profanities had obvious venom behind them. He plunged his hands into the water. It burned like hell but he welcomed every bit of this pain. Fucking nerd! Looking down on me all this time! He fired another massive explosion. He was pushing himself too hard too fast but he didn't care. The group that trained with one had been dispersed as he wasn't here. Kirishima was training with Ojiro. Taking a small break he looked at his friend, almost worried. Bakugo's in the zone today, huh? Ojiro asked. I guess. Still can't believe he was targeted and kidnapped and we didn't know. Yeah, good thing one was around. Right. Kirishima agreed. Bakugo screamed while firing another explosion. Kirishima noted how different he was. The look in his eyes and tone of his voice had outright hatred. 
I think everything last night gave him something to think about, he said before turning back to train with Ojiro. Aha! Bakugo roared as he let off another banger explosion before plunging his hands back in the water. I'm gonna fucking kill that nerd! He turned to Momo who was eating and creating at the same time. That ponytail bitch. She knew the whole time. I swear they'll both pay for this. The thought with utter malice and rage. Momo was doing her best to focus on training, but she couldn't help but worry about Izuku. The incident last night in Kamino was all anyone was talking about this morning, and she wished she could be with him right now. She caught the battle live and watched it with some of the girls on Aji's laptop. Everyone was in utter shock at what they were seeing and Momo did her best to hide her concern. She was able to hold it in and not alert the other girls that she was worried for her boyfriend, but she still had a feeling she needed to see Izuku. She hasn't had a moment to check her phone, and she couldn't escape the feeling something was happening. She would try calling Izuku when she had a break, and she could feel the malice oozing off of Bakugo. She caught his hateful glances at her but easily ignored him. For the time being she needed to train to get her provisional license. At Rising Sky Izuku was using both hands to block the barrage of punches from Saki and Kiyuki. The two had perfect coordination and were clearly a seasoned duo. He deflects a punch from Kiyuki before disappearing in a flash of speed. The girls could sense him behind them but as they turned around they were met by a spiral air slash. Both girls were unable to dodge as the attack sent them crashing into a wall. Izuku turns and raises a knee, using his leg to block a kick from Rumi. The two clashed, traded a blurring battle of kicks that caused shockwaves to ripple out and shake the ground. Izuku overwhelmed Rumi, kicking her in her left upper arm before nailing her with a side kick that sent her flipping across the courtyard. He didn't stop his advance as he jumped, spun and contorted his body, firing four air slashes that skipped off the air before they converged on Rumi with a loud crash. All three women were down, and the dust kicked up had them concealed. Izuku stood ready to keep going as he faced Kiyuki and Saki. He could sense they were not seriously injured just now but something felt off, he sensed embarrassment. As the dust cleared he saw both the girls, he grew a shade of pink at their current state. Dang Izuku, nice move. Kiyuki spoke up. Ah, uh, G.U.H. Saki stammered. As the dust fully cleared he could see that the top of the girls' G.I.s were in tatters. Not just that, but the bras they had been wearing were just the same, exposing both of their bare, bodacious breasts. Saki was red as a tomato as she tried to cover up while Kiyuki stood there casually with a sly smile not even trying to cover up. There was a moment of silence and a wind passed over them before Izuku realized he was staring. He quickly turned around in the opposite direction. I'm sorry. I swear that wasn't intentional. You sure about that? Rumi asked. Facing the older woman he saw that she was in the same state as the girls. The only difference is she looked at him with a seductive look without an ounce of shame. Yes. This was absolutely an accident. He exclaimed while trying to fight his rising erection. Saki screamed with embarrassment before bolting it into the house. Kiyuki just eyed her greenet friend, her sly smile never faltering. Are you just gonna leave me like this Izuku? She asked, shamelessly gesturing to her voluptuous breasts. Izuka let out a light chuckle. I guess not. He took off his shirt before handing it to his friend. Kiyuki took the shirt, put it on and buttoned it up. Appreciate you. She said with a smile and she walked to the house. Izuka took off his tank top and gave it to Rumi. Here you go Rumi. Thanks kid. She put on the tank top. By the way, I never asked what made you come over this morning. I needed to speak with Keizo about something. He answered honestly. Is this about last night in Kamino? Kinda. Rumi stretched. All right. I'm gonna go take a shower. Her eyes morphed into a sexy look. Wanna join me? Izuka gave a charming smile. Later, after I've talked to Keizo. I'll be waiting, stud. She walked towards the dorm and Izuka couldn't help from eyeing her ass as she walked away. Rumi sensed his eyes on her, 
Knowing what he was looking at she gave her ass a quick spank while turning her head and giving him a look that said, Come and get it. Izuku took a step, ready to follow the rabbit woman when he then remembered where he was and all the discipline that had been drilled into him here. He took a breath and cleared his mind. Keizo first, as second. He thought as he made his way towards the house. He stepped onto the porch and into the house. He found Keizo playing a guitar in the living room. The master's eyes were closed as he strung a beautiful song, truly engrossed in the music he was making. He finished playing and after a moment of silence he addressed his student. Good morning, Izuku. He greeted his student, finally opening his eyes. Good morning, master. New song? Yes, actually. I call it Snow Fairy. I'll put lyrics to it later. I sense the commotion outside. A wardrobe malfunction, I presume? He asked, noting his shirtless disciple and the half-naked girl in a tattered G.I. that bolted by him a moment ago. Izuka sighed lightly as he gently scratched his cheek. Yeah, we may have gone a bit overboard. Well, strong opponents do tend to bring out advancement in a fighter. True enough. I actually came here because I wanted to speak with you. Is this about the situation last night in Kamino? Maybe. You remember those ninjas we visited on a training trip a few years ago? Yes, I recall. The Fuga clan, what about them? I think I saw one of them last night. He was helping the LOV attack the UA first years at a training camp. Keizo's purple eyes narrowed at this news. He put his guitar to the side and stood up. Come with me. Izuka followed the master to the dojo when he went into the office pulled out a book and he handed it to Izuku. The greenette flipped through the pages and saw it contained headshots of every member of the Fuga clan. He scanned page after page until he found a familiar face. He was much younger, but he was certain it was him. This is him. Izuku pointed out the picture and handed the book back to Keizo. Upon seeing the person in question Keizo seemed to get an idea of what was going on. I remember we spent a few days on that compound in the mountains and I remember seeing this guy but I don't recall his name," Izuka said as the master eyed the photo. Who is he exactly? Keizo closed his eyes before making eye contact with his disciple. This is Ryuya Kazumaki. He's the son of Haya Kazumaki. Hai? He was their leader, right? That's right. However, there was an incident. By all accounts. Every member of the clan was killed. Izuka narrowed his eyes at this. Killed? From my understanding these were powerful users of ninjutsu. How could they just be wiped out like that? That's the mystery, Izuku. About a year ago the lifeless bodies of the members were found scattered across the compound. By the time they were found they had mostly decayed but the wounds found on the bodies coincided with that of a sharp blade. A blade? Izuka thought to himself, then he remembered Kazumaki's wind quirk. Kazumaki has a wind quirk, I've seen it in action, and we both know the damage air slash can do. You think he murdered the clan? It's just a suspicion given what you've told me. But say it is true, what reason would he have to commit such a crime? Keizo crossed his arms. From what I know of him he was a passive boy. I always spoke highly of him. Keizo paused for a moment as if remembering something. Izuku noticed the shift in his master. Master? Izuku, what are your thoughts on the occult? I believe there's some truth to that stuff, but I try not to put too much into it. Why? Keizo had a look in his eyes Izuku's never seen before. It could almost be called unsettled. Whatever he was about to tell him, it was strange. As you know, the Fuga clan are a family of ninja with a history that go all the way back to at least 300 years. In that time there have been a fair bit of rumors about them, the largest of which is that they worship a creature as their god. A creature? I'm not entirely sure on the details, but I recall my father telling me once that of how the Fuga were once a clan that held control over a monster. This monster was defeated and sealed away by the most powerful warriors of the era. But it's been hinted that that practice still persists. Izuku was skeptical of this story. He always took in Keizo's wisdom heartily but this one just seemed too much like a fairy tale. 
Then again, there was a kaiju under the mountains of Yamanashi so he shouldn't be so skeptical. So you think he killed everyone because this monster they worship told him to? It's just an idea that came from passing along information. Okay, does this monster have a name? As I recall, it was called Orochi. Izuka took in his master's words. Orochi, huh? Noted, thank you, master. Unfortunately, that's all the information I can give you, Izuku. Thank you anyway, master. This was very helpful. So how are you going to handle your current situation? The master asked knowingly. Izuka took a breath. You see right through me as usual. I knew this was only a matter of time before all this came up, and I've ran through several options of how to handle it when the day came. Once quirkless statues is now a hot topic. You've done good at keeping it hidden until now. Still, I never agreed with you keeping that hidden. When you first came to us and told us what you wanted to do, I accepted your path as your master because I knew you wouldn't fail. But in becoming the hero you always wanted to be you hide an important detail about yourself. I understand protecting your identity but you should have let that be known. Izuka lowered his head slightly as he took in his master's words. Keizo wasn't wrong. He admittedly thought about revealing his quirkless status on multiple occasions, most likely through a live stream video on the app. But he was always hesitant. He knew who he was and what he could do but that didn't change the fact that he was still a little scared of how people would view him if they knew the infamous vigilante was quirkless. The media would have had a field day, and every hero would seriously hate him. It might put those he cares for in danger, and it would also make it easier for them to identify him. He was pretty sure he was the only quirkless person in Musidafu, while also the most recent quirkless person to apply for the hero course. You're right, master. In hindsight, it probably would have been best to just let that be known. He sighed. Well, it can't be helped now. And besides, I've checked the community section of the app and people are really interested in knowing if this is true or not. Not for their sake, but for someone they care for. I won't need to take off my cowl, but I can let the people know I don't have a quirk. I wonder how they'll take it. Keizo smiled. You may not want to be a symbol, Izuku, but someone like you could be that to someone even now. I guess my title should be the quirkless hero one, he said with a smile. Definitely not, Keizo retorted. But the fact that you're quirkless will definitely change how people see people like you. Izuka ready to leave. And that's all I ever wanted. Not having a quirk doesn't mean I'm useless or powerless. I just wish it didn't take me becoming what I am for people not to think that. It'll work itself out, Izuku. So, any plans for today? I promised Eri I'd take her out later. I have to go see Taka later, but in the meantime, I guess I'll just hang. Although Okoto may be mad at me for a while. Keizo chuckled. The fumblings of adolescence. She'll get over it. They both shared a laugh as they both knew how the girl would be for a while. Izuka met his master's gaze as he remembered something. By they, I forgot to ask before, but how exactly do you know Prime Minister Yamato? Keizo smiled. Nao? Oh, I should have figured you got your independent license from him. Yeah, when he gave it to me that night he told me tell you and Michiko he said hi. Of course he did. To answer your question he was a student of Rising Sky once upon a time. Though as I remember he was better at fighting with his head than his fists. Izuka chuckled at remembering his meeting with the Prime Minister. Yeah, he said he was just a guy who practiced martial arts once. He even used the perfect Nikiyashi on me, even I can't do that. Though he didn't have too many natural gifts he still worked hard. Michiko liked him, they even dated briefly, much to father's annoyance. The elder didn't like him? He asked, referencing the late master of the dojo. Keizo closed his eyes and smiled. That guy was a special kind of pervert back in the day. I just rolled with it, as I knew he was harmless. I'd like to hear more stories like that sometime. The master and student left the dojo and went into the courtyard. Keizo went back in the house and Izuku went to Rumi's dorm room. He opened the door and there he found her, fully naked ass up face down violently playing with herself. 
Her cunt was dripping wet as her juices sprayed all over the bed. She turned her head and met eyes with the teen. She heard him come in, and her pace didn't slow down as her lustful expression was prevalent. Izuka closed the door and stood there, a charming smile on his face as he watched the rabbit woman pleasure her most sensitive area. He noted how his tank top was hanging off a desk chair as well as the wet stains on the bed. She'd clearly just left the bath and been waiting for him to show up. He also noted a small bottle of lube on the desk. He could barely contain his excitement as he knew what this meant. Looking down at Rumi who was still pleasuring herself he spoke. Rabbit libido knows no bounds huh? He said sexily with a charming smile. Rumi stopped stroking. You have no idea what it does to me. She answered with an excited smile before flipped back laying on her back with her head towards the end of the bed. Izuku approached her, and she reached out to massage the bulge in his shorts, once he was close enough. Izuku grabbed a handful of her left boob and massaged her beautiful mammary. Poor bunny! Let me give you an outlet! His shorts and underwear dropped in one motion, his huge dick casting a shadow over Rumi's face. She couldn't contain her wetness as the mere scent of the dick above her was intoxicating. She brought a hand up to gently stroke the dick. Yeah, this is exactly what I needed. Izuka smirked. This was about to be fun. He was going to see Taku after this but until then, he was gonna be busy banging his favorite bunny. Fujiwara Lab Takumi was sitting at the supercomputer looking at various photos and videos of Dr. Ijiko. He had been at this for about half an hour and had gone through the doctor's list of respected accolades. He still had a hard time believing that one of the world's most respected quirk doctors was in league with a villain like AFO. Upon realizing this it put the final piece of the Noma puzzle in place. The good doctor is the mad scientist they've been looking for. He's the one who makes the Nomu. All for one just provides the quirks. He found multiple videos of Ujiko discussing quirk theory and various studies of quirks, from how they can affect people's personality, and the emotional link between the powers and the user's emotions. Izuka would be here later and Melissa was on her way, but until then he was going to look into this. The media and the app was on fire because of AFO's big fat mouth, the battle at Kamino while intense isn't getting nearly as much attention as the once quirk status. He had checked the app this morning and that and the fight were all people were talking about. Thankfully most of it was supportive but there are those idiots with negative thoughts of quirkless people. He knew this day would come but he wasn't at all worried. Izuka could handle this no problem and as his sidekick he was gonna ride with him no matter how this turned out. As he was reading an article on Ijiko he heard footsteps behind him. It was his grandfather. Hey Takumi! I finished those upgrades you can install them whenever you want. The older man said, wiping his hands as he approached his grandson. His eyes became quizzical as he saw what Takumi was doing. Why so fascinated with Ijiko? Trying to find a clue. Something that can lead us to his secret lab. He answered. The grandfather was perplexed. What? Secret lab? What are you talking about Takumi? I'm talking about how Ijiko is the mad scientist we've been looking for. You remember those Noma things? Yes. Chuntaro's eyes narrowed. What do you base this on? This. Taku hit a key and the video of AFO talking to Ijiko came on the screen. It showed them speaking about one, the LOV's attack and the development of more Nomu, something called High Ends. Chuntaro was shocked at seeing this. So he was working with the villains. Among other things apparently. The guy's name is all for one by the way. He can steal and give quirks. Well that's a thing. Think this is the last we'll see of him? Definitely not. Even with the upgrades to the Tartarus system I highly doubt it'll contain him. But one isn't going anywhere. And if he does escape he'll just get bitched again. Language. The older man said sternly. Anyway, isn't Melissa on her way over? Yeah, she'll be here in a bit. I want to show her my new tornado. Be careful flying that thing, he said before turning and heading to his workbench. We'll do, Grandpa. Taku finished reading the article on Ijiko and made a note to visit Jaku General Hospital. 
he stood up. Guess I'll add those upgrades to Genos. Hopefully I can test them out later. He thought aloud before going to another section of the lab. Rising Sky Izuku had gotten dressed. After fucking intensely for two hours Rumi was knocked out sleeping peacefully. Sex with Rumi was as great as always. While normally time would have gotten away from him he had to remember he had other things to do today. After a gentle kiss to the sleeping woman's forehead he left the room. It was a little around 12 o'clock and he needed to see Taku. They had a lot to go over in regards to everything from yesterday and how to move forward with his quirk situation. As he passed the courtyard he sensed eyes on him. Izuku! He heard the voice of Kiyuki call out to him. Turning in the direction of the voice he saw both Kiyuki and Saki stepping off the porch. Kiyuki was wearing a light blue short sleeve crop top, black shorts and light blue and white sneakers while Saki was wearing a black tank top with black, red and white camo capri pants and black and red low tops. He stopped and waited for them to catch up. What's up girls? You got any plans today? I was about to head over to Taku's house, wanna come? Sure. We were looking for something to do anyway. Kiyuki said as she lightly pulled Saki along who had an expression that was a mix of anger and embarrassment. I guess going to see the bug wouldn't be that bad, she said with a slight blush. Here you go by the way. Kiyuki handed Izuku back his shirt. Thanks. Izuku took his shirt back and put it on. He noted the blonde girl's current state. Okoto you're not mad at me are you? I swear that was an honest mistake. He said with sincerity knowing the girl well enough to know she's likely to hold this against him for a while due to her tsundra tendencies. Saki was still red as she closed her eyes slightly irked. It's fine Midoriya. Her indigo eyes opened and her usual intimidating angry expression shined. But you better know I'm going to get you back for that at some point. Izuka smiled casually. Fair enough. Come on Saki, you're making a bigger deal out of this than it is. The black-haired girl smiled mischievously as she shifted and got behind her friend and playfully groped her boobs. With tears like these you can't blame the boys for wanting to check him out. She joked as her groping got more intense. Saki was beet red from her friend's fondling. Kiyuki! Izuka smiled as he watched the scene. At the risk of sounding like Taku, you deal have a mesmerizing chest, Okoto. Saki's eyes widened. Shocked to hear this from Midoriya as Kiyuki's smile deepened. See Dot. Saki couldn't take it anymore. Can we please stop talking about them? She exclaimed with embarrassment. Some time passed and after they were done teasing Saki the three left the dojo. By the way Kiyuki, I noticed the dojo is pretty empty for this time of year. Did no one come to live here for the break? Nope. Apparently no one wanted to eat, sleep, and live martial arts this summer. That's a shame. The summer and winter breaks were some of the funnest times at the dojo. But I do admit the training during those times was the most hellish. Like the 36-hour days? Kiyuki asked knowingly with a smile. Exactly! Izuku exclaimed from pleasant nostalgia. Oh man, I thought I was gonna die halfway through my first week of that. What are you two talking about? Saki asked, genuinely curious. Kiyuki returned to Saki. Oh yeah, since we're not doing it this time, guess you wouldn't know. During the summer and winter breaks when students live at the dojo daddy and auntie do a thing called Hell's Week. What this basically is is that the days are considered 36 hours instead of 24. You train for 24 and the other 12 are used for eating and sleeping. You repeat this cycle seven times, getting in a week when it's really been roughly ten and a half days. Most people can hack it their first time, and I was able to make it through because of this guy. She said looking at Izuku. That seriously messed up my sleep for a while. I was only seven at the time, I didn't complain at all and if I'm being honest after those first eighteen hours my body was on autopilot. And for the rest of that week I just willed myself to keep going because I didn't want to let the masters down. I remember. I was way stronger than you back then, and even I had trouble. That was the first time I learned the difference between training with my dad and aunt, 
and training with Master Keizo and Michiko. Kiyuki chuckled at her unpleasant past. By the way, Midoriya, how come you never talked to us about that one thing? Saki asked. Kiyuki turned to the greenette. Yeah, we're friends, right? We've known for months and I'm still a little salty you made us figure it out and not tell us. EFF you for that, by the way. They were down the street from the dojo and Izuku noted they were basically alone. He brought a finger to his lips as he spoke. Show Kodo. Sorry for not telling you too, but be careful how you word that topic, especially now. Kiyuki smiled mischievously. Oh yeah, you're just a quirkless nobody who comes from who knows where. You can't beat me. You have any idea who I am? I don't give a damn who you are because it doesn't matter. Whoever you are, I will beat you. She acted out dramatically as Izuka covered his eyes with a slight blush. That was actually really cool in real time, Izuku. Then please don't make fun of it. Trust me when I say that guy had to go down. Who was he anyway? Saki asked. A powerful villain who is a special kind of evil. The details don't matter too much, but he's got connections I need to take care of. That's one reason why I'm going to Taku. The moment I realized it was you I knew that bug was involved somehow. You two are the ones who told us about the app after all, Kiyuki stated. It's common knowledge that word of mouth is the quickest way to spread information, albeit leading or misleading. True enough, Saki agreed. Yo, Izuku, you gotta have a funny story about patrolling. Let's hear one, Kiyuki asked. Izuku scratched his cheek as he registered her question. I do, but you really want to hear one? You never talk to us about that stuff, so let's hear it. Izuka shrugged. All right. Flashback two months ago. One had tracked a series of faulty card readers back to a building in Tokyo. This operation was to make card readers and line them inside the card readers at gas pumps, allowing those in control to steal people's information and money. He was in a dark office of one of the buildings looking for evidence and anything that would help him shut this down. He sensed roughly 18 people in this building and he could hear the sound of them talking as well as the footsteps of those walking past the room. He was crouched down as he looked through a file cabinet when he sensed someone outside the door, the handle turned. I swear whoever's in here about to get their ass motherfucking beat on everything I low dash. A tall brawny man with red skin and light hair wearing a gray suit angrily stated as he entered the room. His arrogance faded in an instant when he saw one going through files, the two just stared at each other in silence for over five seconds as the man decided his next course of action. He stammered for a moment. Oh. Um. Oh look, I don't want no smoke bruh, I'm a fan to tell you the truth. He pointed. What you're looking for is in that third drawer on the left side of the desk. Cool? All right, I'm just looking out. He said before closing the door. And flashback. Kiyuki was laughing hysterically while Saki smiled amused. So you just took what you needed and walked the fuck out? Kiyuki asked through her laughs. Izuka smiled confidently. Yep. Saki smiled as she locked eyes with the green-haired teen. Wow, remind me to put more respect on your name, Midoriya. The three continued on their way until they reached the gate at Taku's house. His mom opened the door for them and they walked up the driveway to the house and were greeted by Megami. Midoriya, Okoto, Tabihara, it's good to see you. How have you kids been? Saki answered first. I've been fine, ma'am. She answered with a bow. Fine, I can't complain too much. Kiyuki answered. I've had a morning, Izuku answered. The older woman locked eyes with the greenette. I can imagine. I saw and heard what happened in Kamino last night. Takumi's been cooped up in the lab most of the morning. If you need anything you're more than welcome to ask Midoriya, my publicist is amazing. Her smile was warm and assuring. Thank you ma'am, I'll remember that. Izuku sensed Taku's presence and turned around just as his friend came from down a hall with Melissa in tow. What up, what up, people? Taku greeted his friends. What's up, my guy? Both boys did a fist bump as Kiyuki and Saki greeted them as well. 
Hey, Melissa, wasn't expecting to see you here? Kiyuki asked the American. I asked Fujiwara if I could come over yesterday and he said yes. We actually just hopped off the tornado. The new upgrades are awesome. I bet. You gotta show me later, Izuka stated. Me too, Kiyuki added raising her hand. The teens began to talk among themselves. Taku asked the girls to wait in the game room as he and Izuka walked down the hall towards the lab. Taku types in a security code into a keypad, places a hand to a hand scanner. A retinal scanner comes from the wall with Taku putting his eyes to it and confirming him. He went to a little mic that came from the wall. Fuji mode. His words caused several machine gun torrents to drop from the ceiling with red beams pointed right at Izuku who wasn't phased by them in the slightest. And guessed. These words were accepted and the guns disappeared back into the ceiling. They step into the elevator and went down. They exit the elevator into the massive lab and make their way towards the supercomputer. I'm not against taking a day off but we're gonna need to finally handle your quirk situation. I know. I actually spoke with your mom and she recommended her publicist to put a positive spin on it," Izuka said with a small smile. Taku chuckled. That's a damn good deal, Kiano is good at what she does. Or we can just do a live stream Q&A, no need to go on a major platform when you can be in charge of your own narrative. Plus I think it'll hit harder if the people hear it from you first. I've been thinking about this all morning. I'm not against the live stream, but let's save this problem for tomorrow. We've put in a lot of hours investigating the LOV and AFOs, so let's take the day to decompress. Taku nodded. I'm fine with that. But before that, I think you need to see this. He hit a couple keys and all the research he'd done on Ajiko came up on the screen. Izuku narrowed his eyes at the photos, videos, and articles of the man on the screen. I know this guy. He was the quirk doctor who diagnosed me as quirkless. He was so blunt about it I could never forget that face. Taku was surprised to hear this. Really? Totally didn't know that. My reason for showing you this is to show you that this is him. This is the mad scientist we've been looking for. AFO provides the quirks, but the one who engineers Nomu is all him. Taku explained, pointing at the screen. Izuka's eyes were full of shock. The man who had not only diagnosed him as quirkless was also AFO's partner in making the Noma. Finding that person was his next step along with catching the league again, but to know that it was someone at the center of one of the worst days of his life was shocking. His face became serious as he turned to Taku. What have you got? Mainly just theories right now, the biggest of which is that he has a lab somewhere where he's currently making a new type of Noma called Hyans. Hyans. Taku hit a key and the video of AFO talking to Ujiko the night before came up on the screen. Upon allowing Izuku to see the full video of the conversation he spoke again. Don't know what they look like but they seem pretty excited for them. They said one was ready and it's only a matter of time before they unleash it. The words of a new Noma made Izuku think back to his time in Kashik, where he fought a Kaza who was turned into one. He remembered vividly about how it could talk. I think I may have seen one before. You remember the situation in Kashyyyk and we separated? When I was kidnapped with Overhaul we fought a Noma that was both stronger and more intelligent than the one I fought before. Yeah you told me about that. You said it could talk and you suspected a former student from the dojo was the base for it right? That's right, an AFO basically confirmed it. But that Noma specifically used Rising Skies style of karate. Its stance, how it punched, kicked and had Akaza's personality of using his strength to beat strong people set it apart from the others. Its mind and sentience wasn't completely gone despite being a living corpse. Taku turned back to the monitor. I think we should pay the good doctor a visit. Jaku General always seemed just too perfect. That hospital has a large outreach program, doesn't it? Not only that, people travel from all over to visit Jaka General in regards to quirk-related issues. Much of the country's information on the latest quirk studies and medical practices come from Ajiko's own mouth. Many people look to the hospital for getting them the help they need in regards to the negative aspects or issues with their quirks. Izuka looked at the monitor, 
the bald man's face had been seared into his brain since that day. He was so enthusiastic about becoming a hero when he grew up. Sorry kid it's not gonna happen. The doctor's bluntness was something he would never forget as his entire world cracked in that moment. This is just a thought, but I think he can lead us to the league. He's clearly AFO's closest associate so wherever Kuro Jairi sent them he would definitely know. Let's investigate him and in the meantime keep an eye out for any chaos that may rise up. Taku faced Izuku with a confident smile. Got it. There was a moment of silence as the two allowed the information and their next move to set in. Let's head back upstairs, the girls will get on us if we take too long. Izuku said turning to head towards the elevator. Installation complete. He heard a computerized voice say from a corner of the lab. He had his suspicions for a while now and this was the perfect time to confirm them. He walked in the direction of the voice. Building something? Taku saw what direction he was heading in and slightly panicked. Yeah, I've been working on this self-driving car, nothing too special. He said nonchalantly. Really? That sounds pretty interesting to me, mind if I check it out? Izuka asked as he kept walking, not turning around to look at him. Taku caught up to him. I told you it's not that deep, Izuku. I've built way cooler. True, but I've never seen a self-driving car before. He was close to the place. It's just something I crapped out on a whim. Come on, let's go back upstairs or Saki will have my ass. Taku was playfully trying to stop Izuka from going forward. Izuka saw right through his best friend. As if you wouldn't enjoy that. He smiled as he juked past Taku and ran over. I told you it's lame, bro. Taku jumped on Izuka's back as he arrived at the scene. The Greynet was covering the Greynet's eyes to keep him from looking. Izuka pulled Taku's hands off his face and wasn't at all surprised at what he was seeing. Strapped to an operating table was Genos. His cybernetic body was on full display with new, black modifications. His body was surrounded by robotics to help put him together. His body lay motionless as he seemed to be deactivated. Izuku turned to Taku with a blank expression. Taku returned one of his own and couldn't hold it in for five seconds before it broke down, and he started laughing. You gonna cut the shit now? Taku stopped laughing and took a breath. How long have you known? From the beginning, on that first day in Tokyo. Taku crossed his arms. Damn you. You couldn't even let me pretend to be inconspicuous? How can a cyborg possibly be inconspicuous? Shut up. You gonna explain this or what? Remember the island incident? Back then when the chaos broke out I didn't have any gadgets on me and it made me think about modifying myself with cybernetics. You didn't? I did. I knew grandpa and my folks would say no with the whole. You're still growing. B.S. So I did the next best thing. I cloned myself, changed the features a bit, and gave the clone all the modifications I would have done on myself. Izuku was shocked to hear this explanation, as he suspected Genos was made by Taku, he had no idea he was a clone. You crazy dash, does Genos know he's a clone? No. Because Genos doesn't have a consciousness of his own, he's basically an empty shell. Taku walked around the table and picked up a large ring. This baby right here is the key to the whole deal. He put the ring on his head and sat down. After 10 seconds Genos began to stir on the table before his eyes lit up and he sat up. Hello Aizu. Genos said his usual voice with a sly smile. Izuka's eyes went back and forth from his friend's body on the floor and the cyborg on the table. After a quick observation he fully understood what was going on. So you're transferring your consciousness to Genos. That's what you meant by empty shell. Exactly. As long as my real body is safe, even if Genos is destroyed my consciousness will just go back to my real body. It's almost like being in a VR game. I'm going to regret asking this but why did you do this? Just watching the action got boring. I wanted to be more a part of it, to see this, hero life, the way you see it. But the normal me could only do so much. But with Genos and all the modifications I've done to him. Along with having my quirk, he's the perfect partner to have in the field. 
Izuku took in his words. He wasn't mad at him in the slightest. He was even more impressed with his best friend. He wanted a more active role, and while their hearts aren't the same, Taku definitely has the qualities of a hero. Truthfully, all he was lacking was strength, but with a cybernetic body and his morality, he could definitely be a hero. Hell, Genos has been a valuable ally in his recent cases. The day they met he made it clear he wanted to fight alongside him, and seeing him in the field he's more than capable of doing that. Alright then. So you're cool with this? Not like you gave me much choice. But you're my sidekick, it's only natural we do this together. Whether you fight with me or investigate in the lab this doesn't change the fact that we're a team. He smiled and raised a hand. Geno smiled back at him and the two firmly shook hands. By the way, any chance you can get Yamato to get me an independent license too? I'll see what I can do. In the meantime, let's head back upstairs. Izuka suggested. All right. Geno said as he laid back down. The sitting Taku opened his eyes, stood up and took the ring off his head. Give me a minute? The Greynet said before going to a computer and hitting a bunch of keys. Next moment Genos was lifted up and as some machinery began to dress him. That shouldn't take too long. Okay, let's head back upstairs. They talked with each other as they left the lab. Upstairs they found the girls having a good time in the game room with Melissa dusting the others in a racing game. Saki pouted from her loss as she turned and saw the boys entering the room. It's about time you two showed up. Taku sheepishly rubbed his head. Sorry, we had some business to discuss. He looked at the outcome of the race. Wow, you really suck at games, Okoto. He said bluntly with a sly smile. Saki grew a slight red. Shut up, you pervy bug. I'm just not good at racing games, that's all. Sure, let's go with that. He turned to the American girl. Good to know you're as good as even, Melissa. The blonde blushed slightly. It's not that big a deal, Fujiwara. Kiyuki raised her controller. I got an idea, girls versus boys. Losers take the winners out to eat, you in? Taku chuckled. You know that's a sucker's bet with Saki on your team, right? Saki gritted her teeth from this blow to her pride. What was that? Taku smiled mischievously. Did I stutter? Saki's indigo eyes were threatening as she approached Taku. Izuka intercepted the girl. Now, now, calm down you two, save your lover's quarrel for later. For now, let's play. He guided a beet red Saki back with sly smirking Taku following him. They all got a controller and were ready to get this contest going. After two hours of playing and the boys utterly decimating the girls, the group decided to leave the house and head into town to get some food. Saki and Taku had their back and forth banter about him having personal chiefs so why go pay for food with him boasting that they owe them since they lost in the games, largely because of her. The other three teens couldn't help but laugh at the back and forth of the blonde and grain it. Hey guys, you mind if we swing by my place? I promised Ari I'd take her to the park today, you don't mind if she tags along with us do you? Not at all, let's go grab the itty bitty. Taku agreed. Oh, Lil Eri? Let's go get her. Kiyuki exclaimed excitedly. Sure, let's bring her with us. Saki added. Hopping in a car and getting a ride from a chauffeur, they arrived at the Midoriya residence in no time. Taku sends the driver back to the house and they walk upstairs towards the apartment. They entered to find Inko sitting in the living room reading a book and Eri in her room. After saying their hellos to Inko, Izuka goes to his room to grab his basketball before they all leave the house with Eri. The group talk amongst themselves as they make their way towards the park. They decide to eat after playing around, maybe even do karaoke after. Eri was on Taku's shoulders as they went along. Hey Lil Eri, you wanna play ball with us when we get there? Yeah! The little girl answered cheerfully. Izuku dribbled his ball as they walked. I've been teaching Eri how to play a little bit. She's got some game, actually. Now I want to see it, Kiyuki stated. They arrive at the playground and Eri makes a beeline for the swings when Taku takes her off his shoulders. Melissa and Saki follow the excited girl as Izuku, Taku, and Kiyuki go to the basketball court. Izuku dribbles to the top of the key and pulls ups, 
knocking down the J. That's a three-pointer, Kiyuki commented. Taku gets the ball and passes it back to Izuku who does a dribble move into a step-back jumper making a perfect swish. Kiyuki gets the rebound and passes it back to him. Izuku went on to make his next 14 straight shots. Kiyuki was irritated at not getting the ball and after Izuku made a deep three Taku smiled excitedly and decided to take his phone out. I'm recording this. Tabihara, get his boards. He ordered as he got behind Izuku who got the ball back and shot a corner three. Izuku made 106 threes before he finally missed one and he was moving at game speed. Taku was jumping excitedly when he finally missed, not because he missed but because he got that on camera. Dude, you could shatter the world records if you want. Taku exclaimed, jumping happily. Some other time, Taku. Kiyuki got the ball and did an up and under layup. Happy she could finally work with the ball as she dribbled. Hey, what can I say? Practice makes perfect. Izuka smiled as he imitated his shooting form. Obviously. I'm posting this. He exclaimed as he messed with his phone. Izuku turned to the hoop as Kiyuki's shot went in. He got her board and passed it back to her. Wanna do a shootout, Kiyuki? He asked jokingly. Hell no! She responded as she did a step back three and knocked it down. Izuku chuckled, turning to Eri on the playground and Saki and Melissa sitting on the swings talking to each other. I'll be right back. Izuku walked over to the play's cape as Eri crossed the bridge to the slide. Izuku jumped on the monkey bars and brought his legs over the bars to hang upside down. Melissa walked towards them while Saki joined Taku and Kiyuki. Eri went down the slide and ran to go again when she saw Izuka hanging upside down. I didn't know you could do that, Izuni. The greenette smiled at her. I've been doing this since I was your age, Eri. You want to try it? It's really fun. Eri shook her head. No, thank you. Saikawa is always doing that, though. Is that right? I told you it was fun. Izuka corrected himself and went to play with Eri. For the next hour and a half the group played and hung out together. Izuku would flip from his friends to Eri. Melissa tagged along with them until they all came down to the court to shoot hoops together. Kiyuki had fun teasing Melissa as she sucked at basketball but the American assured she was much better at football. Taku posted the video of Izuku shooting online and Izuku went to the smaller hoop so Eri could shoot. UA High Gym Gamma Mario was running through extensive drills in a combination of using OFA and permeation as all might, and Sir Knight I watched and timed him. He had been at this for over two hours, and though it was difficult he smiled through it all. All might stopped the timer after he had finished the drill, he smiled at the result. Nice time young Togata. No, drill it again. Knight I demanded. Yes sir. Mirio smiled and got back to start. All Might turned to his former sidekick. You're pushing him too hard, Night Eye. The man stood firmly with his arms crossed. Compared to the responsibilities he'll have as the symbol of peace, this is nothing. Drill it again, he said more sternly. All Might looked at him unamused. This was clearly a response to the incident in Kimono last night. Not only had AFO made a move, he had also been defeated by one. Compared to how his fight with AFO ended, one came out of it without a single scratch while picking AFO apart like it was easy. When he called him this morning he insisted on joining him in Mirio's training and though AFO was defeated and arrested Night Eye was being too harsh on Mirio in both criticism and motivation. This is still his summer break, Night Eye. Today was only meant for a little light training. There's no need to push him this hard. He's already progressing well with OFA. Naitai gave him a stern expression. Progressing well isn't good enough. You're too lax, All Might. Just how much time do you honestly have left as a pro? Your embers can only remain for so much longer. This boy is your ideal successor. You chose him to carry your mantle, and it's our responsibility to make sure he can maintain the symbol of peace's function. All Might was slightly irked at his words about his remaining embers. That has nothing to do with anything right now. This is about one, isn't it? The two men locked eyes. The look in Night Eye's eyes was telling. 
him defeating all for one was a victory. But Muriel will be the greatest hero in the world, that's what comes from you giving him your OFA. All Might narrowed his eyes at the words of his former sidekick. Is that what this is about? Your worried young Togata will be overshadowed by one? Aren't you? OFA's entire purpose is to defeat AFO. Yet in a strange twist of fate it's not the power passed down from generations that defeats that evil, but a quirkless hero. All Might had a solemn expression as he took in the man's words. You know I was quirkless too, Night Eye. Night Eye took a breath. After all this, do we still not have any idea of who he could be? All Might processed the question. Truthfully, he was relieved and happily accepted that one had taken care of AFO. But with this quirkless accusation, it was only a matter of time before the public was so stirred up he'd have to address it. He wanted another chance at speaking to him. He wanted to actually try and understand him. Though he and several of UA's faculty were the only ones who know, it still wasn't his secret to tell. No, we don't know who he is. But if he is quirkless, it should answer some questions about him. Night Eye didn't respond, but All Might could tell what he was thinking. Be that as it may, we have to continue to push Mirio into becoming the hero he needs to be. For months it's been one thing after another, and he needs to be ready for when another incident occurs. All Might sighed, they just couldn't agree on one. They got back to the training and a sweating Mirio continued to take it all in stride. White Fox Cafe After leaving the park, the group decided to head over to the cafe to get some food. They were sitting in their usual booth with Izuku beside Eri and Taku and Saki across from them with Melissa and Kiyuki pulling up a table beside them. They had finished eating and the plan was to head over to the karaoke bar after this, and right now they were just cutting up with each other. Izuku liked moments like this, days where he took a day off from heroing and just spent time with his friends. He needed to do this more and he hadn't forgotten what the girls said to him earlier. Kiyuki and Saki were his friends and they could be a calming presence in the storm of chaos that was around the corner after his quirk status was revealed. They continued to enjoy each other's company and were in the midst of laughing and joking amongst each other. Their moment of peace was ruined when Izuka felt a shift. He turned outside to see it was surprisingly dark with multiple people looking up. I'll be right back, Izuka said as he got up to leave the cafe with Kiyuki and Taku in tow. The three exited the cafe and looked around at the dark, silent street. Following the lead of those around them they looked up as well and all their eyes went wide with what they were seeing. It was a massive, dark, futuristic ship floating above the city. It was so vast it seemed to be blocking the sun. That is the most evil thing I've ever seen, Kayayuki said uneasy. Taku was in disbelief, this shouldn't be happening. Just like the situation with the meteor they had parameters in place to alert them if a threat ever made its way to Earth, specifically Japan. What the hell grandpa? I can't believe they got this close without tripping a single alarm. He thought as he turned to his friends. Maybe they come in peace, he said, hardly sounding optimistic. Izuka's eyes narrowed as he saw several glints line up the bottom of the ship. I really doubt it, Taku. In a flash of speed he flew into the air just as dozens of giant bullet-shaped bombs were fired towards the ground. Everything moved in slow motion, using skywalk, flash step Izuka shattered each and every bomb one by one before they were even halfway to the ground. The sky crashed, with the noise shattering windows, cracking concrete and buildings all over the city all while a blanket of fire was created overhead from the destroyed bombs. Everyone who saw this from the ground began to panic as they were unsure of what just happened, but one thing was clear, that was an attempted attack. One lands on the roof of a building, Izuka changed into his alpha suit after destroying all the bombs. That was way too close. Had I been slower the whole city may have been taken out. He thought as he looked up to the ship, seeing that the fire began to dissipate. So much for coming in peace. He took a breath. This is as serious as it gets, gotta move fast. He leaped from the rooftop and flew towards the ship with Skywalk. As he flew closer to the ship he saw a glint and shifted his body to dodge another giant, bullet-shaped bomb. 
he watched as it shot past him and flew off into the distance. Those things are fast for as big as they are. He thought as he turned back towards the bomb's line of fire and saw a large gun turret being named by a yellow alien in the far end of the ship. The alien seemed to panic having being spotted as more rounds were fired in his direction. One kicked off the air and skillfully dodged the shots. Performing a spin kick he crushed and stopped a bullet in its tracks before launching it off his foot back at the turret, jamming the gun and making it blow up. This created an opening in the ship with one flying towards the destroyed turret before kicking off the air and flying upwards in the ship like a missile. He tore his way through multiple floors of the ship before he landed in an area surrounded by multiple aliens. The creatures of varying shapes and sizes all had eyes on him and he could sense their shock anxiety, and fear. Incoherent words were spoken by the aliens before they all launched at him. Using a 360-degree spin kick one killed all of the aliens with the wind pressure from the kick shaking up the entire area. One ran down a dark corridor pummeling every alien that crossed his path. He expected the ship to be large on the inside but the interior was basically a maze straight out of a sci-fi novel. He exited the corridor and found a bride over a dark chasm, on the other end a group of aliens prepared to meet him. One crossed the bridge as the aliens rushed him from the other side, the hero threw a punch with the wind pressure tearing a hole through the ship and obliterating any aliens within range. One continued on his way, I need to find their leader, or at least some way to take out their weapon systems. Back on the ground. Taku and Melissa were running towards the Midoriya residence. It was chaos on the street as many were fearing that this was the end of the world and were looking for some semblance of safety. Kiyuki and Saki had broken off from the group, most likely to prepare for a fight while the three of them had to get somewhere safe. Every media outlet was now covering the ongoing situation in Mizurifu and all who saw could hardly believe their eyes. Heroes were being called to mobilize and civilians were being urged to get inside. The situation was intense as there were so many unknowns. Taku was holding Eri while Melissa was running behind him. Where are we going Fujiwara? Izuka's house. We gotta get inside. He replied as he held Eri up with his right arm and held her hand to pull her along with his left. Eri had her arms around Taku's neck. She couldn't take her eyes off the ship above the city. It was scary and it made her uneasy. They were going back home and Izuka wasn't with them, which was something that worried her. She held on tighter to Taku. Takuni, where's Aizuni? They Greynet could hear the worry in her voice. He however wasn't at all worried. One was all over this. Don't worry about him a bit Lil Eri. He went with the girls, he'll be back later. And don't worry about that ship either, my hero's all over it. He said in an assuring tone. Eri seemed content with this response while Melissa was a little surprised. His hero? I didn't know he was big on heroes. Wait, didn't Uncle Might say he was going to be at UA today? He may still be there. If not, he's definitely on his way. Either way, we have to deal with that ship and the aliens quickly. Papa once said if aliens ever came to Earth the plan is to establish contact, but if they proved hostile the plan is to destroy them by any means necessary. All of Japan could be at risk here. Melissa! The blonde was brought out of her thoughts by Taku, an anxious expression on her face. Wipe that look off your face. I know this situation is serious and could be the end if we can't handle it. But don't even entertain that idea. They got the drop on us, that's all, and their biggest mistake was not finishing us in one shot. As soon as we're ready, we'll launch our counterattack. His words carried fiery determination. Everyone around them was panicking and freaking out while he was planning calmly. It was quite charming as she took a breath and centered herself. They arrived at the Midoriya residence, and after some knocking Inko opened the door, she took Eri from Taku and they all went into the living room. They saw that the going-ons outside was all over the news. Is it bad, Fujiwara? The mother asked worriedly. Taku was going through his bag, hurriedly looking for something. Kinda hard to tell at this point. We've got a ship the size of a city, with enough firepower to take out a city and everyone in it. It's as bad as it gets, so we gotta move fast. And got it! He exclaimed, pulling.
pulling the head ring from his bag. The three females had all eyes on the screen as reports continued about the situation with Taku laying on the couch. A confused Melissa noted this. What are you doing? Suiting up. I'll explain later, just keep my body safe until I wake up. He put the ring on his head and closed his eyes. The ring on his head glowed in the middle as his consciousness was transferred to his cyborg body. Fujiwara Lab Genos opened his eyes and sat up on the operating table. He was dressed in a gray, sleeveless hoodie, black jeans and sneakers. He's glad he remembered to put clothes on before he left. He clenched his fists before hopping off the table and booking it to the elevator. As he made his way through the lab he spotted his grandfather sitting at the supercomputer looking at the news coverage of the spaceship. He ran down to see what he was doing. Grandpa! The older man was engrossed in what he was doing but still registered his grandson's alternate voice. I was wondering when you'd suit up to Kami. He responded, still hitting keys. Genos had reached the computer. It's bad outside. Do you know how they even got this close? I'm still trying to figure that out. My satellites should have alerted me the moment they were in orbit. They're all operating flawlessly so the only thing that makes any sense is that their cloaking technology is so advanced it fooled the sensors. Does it have any weaknesses we can exploit? The scientist hit a key and a scan of the ship came on screen. It's basically a maze inside and I can't get a read on the armor plating so it's likely stronger than anything we've ever made. I doubt our strongest nukes could break it. However, look right there. He pointed as he clicked on a pink dot on the screen. Most of the energy that's fueling the ship is concentrated right here so this is likely the core. So that should be our target. Sounds relatively simple. These invaders are still unknown, Takumi. Their numbers and abilities should be taken with the utmost seriousness. I know. But I can breathe easier because of that. He exclaimed as he pointed with a confident smile. Chuntaro looked where his grandson was pointing and saw a dot moving through the ship, a dot that was an indicator of a certain person's suit. Seeing this the old man couldn't help but smile. Midori is already on it, should have figured. And with that I'm out. Genos ran towards the elevator. Time for us to strike back. In the center of the city a battle was being waged. The entire block was in chaos after a large, humanoid, dark pale-skinned alien with multiple heads descended from the ship flying with bat-like wings. The creature was confronted by multiple heroes in an attempt to fight it off and protect civilians. They were however cut down quickly. Its power, its speed, its ability to shape-shift its limbs into deadly weapons and worst of all regeneration, were making any and all hope for this situation die. Sheer panic began as people tried to flee from the alien whose bloodlust was so palpable all around could practically taste it. The alien seemed interested in the many people fleeing from it. The remaining heroes froze as they eyed down the seemingly invincible creature. Empty Lady guarded the fleeing public, while Kamui Wood stood bravely before the overwhelming threat. Though injured, he was the only remaining hero out of a group of 20 that quickly mobilized to face this monster. All around him was destruction as blood soaked the streets. The area was stained with death as the bisected and mutilated, lifeless bodies of fallen heroes littered the battlefield. Death arms had been swatted into a wall, a groan of pain being the only indicator that he was alive. Air jet had been vertically bisected, the gory mess forming before the arbor hero almost making him vomit. He held his missing left arm. It had been severed in the blink of an eye with him narrowly dodging a lethal strike. We can't beat this thing. Each of its strikes is lethal. My body's made of wood so I can regrow my arm but still. He looked out to the destruction and death all around him. What do we do? He was so engrossed in his thoughts he didn't notice the alien had closed the distance between them in an instant and was now in mid-swing. The hero's whole life flashed before his eyes as the giant fist was inches from his face. There was suddenly a flash of movement and a loud crash as the alien's fist was swatted away. The alien seemed shocked by this before it was pummeled with a barrage of punches with the final one sending it flying and bouncing off the ground. Kamui Wood's eyes widened as he looked to the back of his savior, 
Of all people he truly wasn't expecting this man to save him. He couldn't be happier that he was here. His black hair flowed as a wind passed over the battlefield, his very presence exuberating strength and confidence. His outfit consisted of a black long sleeve shirt, white pants and Tai Chi slippers. Kamui almost cried as the strongest man he knew was now on the scene. Are you okay, Shinji? The voice of his old martial arts master was as calming as ever. It had been years since he heard his voice, but at this moment it was as if a day hadn't gone by since he last heard it. Yes. I'm okay, master. Keizo turned his head without looking at him and the hero could see the small smile on the man's face. Good. He turned back to the alien that was picking itself up off the ground. I'll take care of this. Your journey does not end today. Help the injured and civilians get to safety. He said calmly as he casually walked towards the alien. Kamui Woods pushed past his pain and acknowledged his master's words. He had never once disobeyed Keizo and he wasn't starting now. However, Master, wait! Physical attacks have no effect on this strange creature. It can shape shift and regenerate. You can't fight it alone. Keizo kept his usual calm expression as he turned and faced his former disciple with a smile. I'm disappointed, Shinji. Have you already forgotten who I am? Have you that little faith with me? Kamui's retort caught in his throat from the man's response. Unspoken words were said between the two before he nodded and went to pick up death arms. Empty Lady was not only surprised at the damage this man had done to the alien, but Kamui being so willing to let him fight on his own. Let's go, Empty Lady, he said, carrying an injured death arms. Wait, just who is that? She couldn't see his lips, but she could tell he was smiling. The strongest man I've ever known. He answered before the ground began to shake and a wave of pressure passed over them, indicating they truly had no place here. Let's go! The blonde deactivated her quirk and followed the man in the opposite direction of the fight, feeling bad to leave the bodies of their comrades behind. Keizo casually approached the alien, his power aura causing shockwaves to ripple with every step, cracking and shaking the ground. I can feel your power, you vile creature. You're strong, but you're just a simple soldier. He had stopped walking with the alien towering over the master. I was in the middle of a tranquilizing haiku when some fools from space tried dropped a bomb on my house. I'll need to thank my disciple later. The alien had a blood-curdling smile as Keizo's power aura shook the ground giving it chills and his aura becoming a surge of dark blue lightning. Keizo took a breath before getting into his stance. He lunged at his enemy in a flash of speed. The alien's hand morphed into a spike to skewer the master. Keizo dodged and unleashed a barrage of punches that turned the alien's body into Swiss cheese. The master rose up and delivered a triple kick to the head, destroying all of them and making the body crumble. Keizo looked down at the dusty remains. Too easy. He thought as the remains of the creature's body swirled and four more bodies formed. So that's its ability. Regeneration and shape-shifting. Plus those extra heads are used for splitting into new bodies, all of which should be assumed to be equal in strength, or a little weaker. Shinji was right, this will be complicated. HM, this may take longer than I expected. As the master analyzed the situation there was a burst of power before all five bodies were destroyed. You couldn't wait ten seconds for me to find my favorite sword? Wait to ditch me for the action bro. The voice of his sister said as the dust faded and her figure came into view. She was wearing a black tank top with knee length gray jeans and black sneakers. Sorry sister, we both caught the sight of Izuku taking out those bombs earlier. He looked up. Just like with that blue villain I figured we could leave this to him, but I guess I got a little worried. Good thing too, I was able to save Shinji just in time. Michiko smirked as she put her katana on her shoulder. Good ol woodsy? Now I'm wishing I got here sooner, I could have said hi. There was a shift in the air as the alien's body fully regenerated. Only this time it didn't have multiple heads. It only had one with ten blood-red eyes with an excited toothy smile spread across its lips. Speaking of high, a voice called out as shot onto the battlefield and blitzed the alien with a flying kick to the face, 
driving it into the ground and tearing through the asphalt. The rabbit hero landed confidently ready to get down. Keza looked to her back. Took a while to get dressed, Mirko? He joked. I almost didn't get her, Michiko added. And I'd have been hella pissed at you for that. She looked up at the ship above the city as the alien got back up. A fiery smile spread across her face. So we're dealing with aliens today? This is gonna be fun. We're sure that there's only one of those things on the ground, right? Keizo asked, logically. I was following you, how should I know? Michiko retorted. Doesn't matter right now, all that does is that we handle the one in front of us. Mirko declared. Ain't that the truth, Ruchan? A female voice called out as two blurs blitzed past the adults. Kiyuki and Saki appeared side by side in front of the alien crouched and ready to jump. The two each perform a jumping high kick. Their collaborated attack landed, sending the alien into the air. We speed blitzed around the whole city. This big bastard's the only one on the ground right now. Kiyuki informed them. My guess, this one's one of the stronger ones on the ship on the ground to do quick damage before they send more down. Saki added. Speaking of down, a confident, strong voice said as a blur appeared above the alien, the creature looked up only to be met by two fists slamming down on its face. Smash! All Might and Mirio roared out, the latter's body shrouded in yellow lightning as their fists sent the alien crashing to the ground, causing its body to splatter and making a crater that shook the whole area. The wind pressure kicked up from the attack roared across the battlefield. The two landed in front of the crater. All eyes were on the number one hero and his successor whose backs were to them. He turned around to face the group. He could see the death and destruction from the air. Forgive me for being late. Is everyone all right? I don't know, you tell me? We were kicking ass before you even showed up. Mirko jabbed. She also noted that Mirio was wearing a UA gym uniform. It's summer break, kid. Who wants to be at school? Mirio laughed. Definitely not me. I was actually doing some training with Sir and All Might when this chaos went down. All Might swallowed his retort. His training with young Togata had lasted longer than it needed to thanks to Night Tai. He even had the two spar in order to force him to acclimate to using more of OFA. When they heard the explosion outside they could hardly believe their eyes at what they were seeing. Once the fire dissipated and the ship came into view it was horrifying. He had used up a lot of his time training with Mario, and didn't have much of it left. He'd never admit it, but he's known since his inspection at Ireland with Dave that each time he used OFA his time and power decreased. He couldn't have possibly anticipated something like this, but the fact they were dealing with otherworldly beings with power that most likely exceeded their comprehension was the worst situation to deal with in his current state. All might, you may want to turn around. That alien can regenerate. Keizo calmly informed him. Wadash. All Might turned just as he was about to be cleaved by the alien. Duck All Might! A voice ordered as the symbol of peace dipped just as the alien was blasted by a massive wave of fire. Endeavor? He thought. All Might had to duck and move as the wave of heat tore through several city blocks. The heat of that blast was so intense it threatened to burn everyone's clothes. All Might had to put out his rabbit hairs that had caught fire and turning towards the origin of the blast he saw a blonde-haired young man with robotic arms, glowing yellow with an arm extended. He had a serious expression as he locked eyes with the hero. Turning away from a battle could be your undoing All Might. The number one hero was shocked to see the one responsible for such a powerful fire attack. His fire power. It's greater than endeavors. Genos looked around at the dead bodies of heroes in the area. So we couldn't stop these invaders from killing anyone. He looked up at the ship. One. Give them hell. Impressive blast, young man. Keizo complimented gripping his chin with a smile. Thank you, sir. But my blast didn't eliminate that thing. It'll be back in a moment, and we need to be ready. These invaders chose the wrong planet, let alone city to attack. He turned in the direction of where the alien should be. Let's make them regret that decision all the way to the grave. Kiyuki put a hand to her hips. 
I like this guy. Mirko smiled confidently. Join the club. Say, weren't you the guy in Kamino with one last night? Yes, that was me. And if you're wondering why he's not here it should go without saying because he's already up there. He said pointing upward. He'll bring that ship down before long, so the least we can do is take care of the groundwork. Agreed. But before that you two have to go. He said, looking at Kiyuki and Saki. His daughter's face contorted to disapproval. Come on daddy you can't just send us away. With all due respect Mr. Tabihara, this is a special set of circumstances, which include many pro heroes not being up to handling this situation, Saki said defensively. Michiko looked to her brother. Come on Keizo. I've been beating these little girls' heads in for a reason, right? Look, if this is about you still not having a Father of the Year award I promise we'll make you one when this is over. Michiko had to hold in her chuckle from the annoyed look her older brother was giving her. Keizo finally sighed. All right. But if it gets too hectic I'm pulling you two out. Kiyuki was about to squeal happily before she was cut off by her aunt's sword being thrusted a millimeter from the dorsum of her nose. The girl as well as everyone else but her father froze in shock at this. Before you celebrate Nisi I suggest you get ready to have your hands full. She turned her head noting that the alien had splinted again and five bodies were making their way towards them. Rumi punched her hand, ready to go. Keizo and the girls got into their respective stances. Michiko sheathed her sword and got into a Badajutsu stance and all might looked around at the determination of his squad. He could tell this group was extremely powerful, and there wasn't a doubt in his mind that they could win. He also didn't forget about what the cyborg said about one already being on the ship. He couldn't get up there so the least he could do was handle any and all threats that were on the ground. All Might readied himself to face the enemy. This group may not be ideal, but let's show these invaders what we're made of. The two sides eyed each other before rushing their opposition in a flash of speed. Prime Minister's Office Neo Yamato sat at his desk. The screen in front of him was showing him the reports of the happenings in Yuzurufu and he was currently on a conference call with world leaders. It wasn't looking good. This incident was being broadcasted all over the world and many feared this invasion was only the beginning. This could quite literally be the beginning of the end of humanity and no one was compromising from the sentiment the aliens needed to be eliminated by any means. That includes the little over 500,000 population of Muzurifu. Many were threatening to fire intercontinental missiles at the ship in hopes of destroying it and the aliens on it. He had issued an order for any and all available heroes to converge on Muzurifu. That city hasn't recovered since the attack of the Blue Villain months ago, and the heroes that did remain in the city wouldn't be enough. This was a situation that required all hands on deck. His secretary, Yakana Yim walked in in the midst of his argument with North Korea. The look on her face was telling. Hold on a minute, North Korea? He lowered the phone. What is it, Yim? She glanced at the screen reporting the incident for a second before turning back to him. Sir, the order you issued was announced throughout Shizuoka and the surrounding prefectures just like you asked. We've received reports that an alien descended from the ship and was confronted by over 20 heroes. However, it appears that most of them were killed before several civilians along with Mirko and All Might arrived and they're engaging the alien right now. Nao's eyes widened in shock. Civilians? As he said this the screen sifted to the fight happening in Muzurufu, he saw the group battling what looked like five aliens. Mirko, All Might and a UA student were dodging attacks and even more shocking he saw Keizo and Michiko fight too. Two teenage girls were like blurs and a cyborg was unleashing fire blasts that would make Endeavor jealous. He also saw the bisected remains of fallen heroes across the battlefield. Do we know where one is? We haven't got any reports of anyone seeing him today, the secretary answered. After the situation last night in Kamino he would naturally take a day off. But I can't imagine him not being involved in this especially if those two are he said, implying Keizo and Michiko. Many heroes have died already and this group seems to be the most effective we could hope for. 
He closed his eyes and grit his teeth as he thought about all the scenarios. He had to trust his old friends and All Might was there. It wasn't a guarantee things would be okay but he never doubted the Tabiharas and he wasn't starting today. He closed his eyes and took a breath before bringing the phone back to his ear. Give us 20 minutes. All of the world leaders on the line began to lose their minds at these words. Many began to argue the idiocy of letting this draw out instead of striking with all they could muster. What are you playing at, Japan? The US president asked. Nothing at all. For the time being this is MY County's problem. I understand the ramifications of us being unable to handle this but it's my job to trust in my people, so for the time being leave this to us. The phone went quiet as everyone took in his words. 10. The Chinese president said. Excuse me? You have 10 minutes before I fire my first nuclear missile. This situation is too grave to leave it to a bunch of heroes. I agree with China, Japan, you have 10 minutes. America agreed. Yamato grit his teeth. 15. This isn't a negotiation, Japan. The French president stated. I agree, give him 15 minutes to resolve this. The president of Germany interjected. Once again everyone went back to talking on top of each other. Enough! The German president yelled into the phone, hurting everyone's ears and making this shut up. He gripped the bridge of his nose and closed his eyes in annoyance. Schweins! He said under his breath. The situation is still touch and go, so for the next 15 minutes we trust Japan to deal with these invaders. If they're not up to the task we initiate our nuclear options. Is that acceptable to you, Japan? Yamato sighed. He had been doing his best to buy as much time as he could and thankfully one of Japan's friends stepped up and helped. Still, he couldn't shake the worry. If this wasn't resolved in 15 minutes, nukes would be launched at the ship with many being caught in the crossfire as collateral damage. He swallowed any retorts he had knowing if the situation were reversed he'd do the same thing. Fine, I accept. There were more words spoken before he hung up the phone. Sir? His secretary asked, concerned. All of Muzudifu is hinging on if those fighting are strong enough to defeat these aliens. He leaned back in his chair and thought to himself. Keizo, Michiko, I've never needed you more than I need you right now. Take care of that freak. One, I don't know where you are, but if your city, this country and its people ever needed a hero it's right now. Yamato hung his head, the feeling of the unknown was irritating, there were only two outcomes here. Either the aliens are defeated, or the time runs out and nukes are fired at the ship, and even then there's no guarantee they'll be strong enough to destroy the ship. Either way they were rolling the dice here, and all he could do was hope for the best. On the ground. One of the aliens' bodies was cut hundreds of times before crumbling away to dust, Mirio became permeable to phase through a sweat before rising up and uppercutting the alien, taking off its head. The headless body continued to fight while the head sprouted small wings. The head looked down at the battle below when it heard a voice. Melzergard! You need to return to the ship. There's an earth dweller who's wreaking havoc in here. The head turned to the ship. What? What's impossible? I'm not kidding. Over half the crew has been killed by this Earth Dweller, and he's wrecked so much of the ship many of the systems are down. Just have Garibas take care of them. He's dead too. The only remaining capable fighters on the ship are myself and Lord Boros. What? His eyes widened at these words. I'm a little preoccupied at the moment. Some of these Earth Dwellers aren't as easy to kill as we expected. Just fire another bombardment, since the first was thwarted. That's a job for the lower ranks and as I've said they're all dead. Our weapon systems have also sustained heavy damage. We can't fire a single shot if we wanted to. There was a rumble that shook the area. Jerry Ruggenship's whole body tensed up. He's getting closer. Deal with it, I have problems of my own. The head turned as it was smashed by Mirio. You just don't know when to quit. The young hero saw a small blue marble falling through the remains of the alien. He quickly grabbed it. He held it between his fingers. What's this? The alien regenerated and smiled mockingly at the hero, 
Its look quickly morphed into shock and fear when it saw what he was holding. It tried to attack him when Mirio crushed the marble. The alien's head and body both disgustingly melted away. Whoa, that's nasty. Mirio said as he brought up his arm to block his nose from the scent. Finally finding a weakness he addressed the others on the battlefield. Everyone! These things have a marble in their bodies. Destroy it and they die. Melzergard looked at the remains. I've been growing that head for over a hundred years and it got killed in this dump. He thought as he felt the shift in all his opponents. Michiko gripped her sword, smiling slyly as she ready to do some cutting. So all I have to do is find this marble to kill you. Noted. She released a wave of power aura and the pressure was so intense it scared all those who weren't related to her. Atomic Slash! She called out as the body before her was cut to pieces. Everything moved in slow motion as the pieces fell. Kicking off the ground she rocketed forward and snatched the marble just as the body reformed itself. The master appeared behind it with a sly, confident smile as she held the marble between her fingers. Look what I found! As the alien turned to strike her, Michiko crushed it between her fingers. She could sense its anguish as it melted away. Three to go. Genos looked around the battle and could see the shift. Looking up at the ship he decided it was time to go. Most of the people here were incredibly strong and now that they had a weakness this alien's time was numbered. He turned to All Might. All Might? The pro turned to him. You all seem to have this under control so I'm going to head to the ship. The symbol of peace gave him a confident smile. That's fine. We still don't know what the enemy is planning up there. Go aid one as best you can. That went without saying. He exclaimed before blasting off with fire from his legs and back. He rocketed towards the ship, arms outstretched until he crashed into it. The armor of the ship was tough. He fired off a barrage of fiery enhanced punches until he finally tore through the hull. Once he makes it inside he sees that the entire area was empty of life and his scanners were not picking up anything. Takumi! He suddenly heard the voice of his grandfather in his head. Grandpa? I don't recall giving outside communications to you. Just like I don't recall telling your parents you cloned yourself just so you could have a cybernetic meat suit. Meh, fair enough. While I've got you on the line you're still monitoring those scans of the ship, right? That's exactly why I called. This ship is vast and you'll get lost if you can't tell where you're going. Midoriya's floors above you. I'll guide you to him. Sweet. Thanks, Grandpa. He leaped up and landed in what looked like a large dark room. The place was a wreck and he could see the floor was soaked deeply with the blood of aliens. Not just the floor. Mangled bodies were scattered all across the room with what seemed like cannons being smashed and bent. Also what seemed like large bombs were lined along the wall and machinery above that connected it all. It's a pretty safe bet once been through here. He saw several control panels lit up in a strange alien language. I think I'm in their gun port. You're at the bottom of the ship and I've surmised that's where their weapons systems were active. Chantaro replied. All right. Genos began to book it down a corridor. Grandpa? Forget about one for right now. Take me to the control room. I'm gonna try and decipher this alien language. You're going to try and fly the ship? Something tells me I'm going to need to. Fine. Keep in mind my map doesn't have an exact area but I think I can surmise where it might be. Keep running for another hundred meters and turn right. Got it. Genos said seriously before picking up speed. In another part of the ship. One was speed blitzing through the ship. He had killed countless aliens who attempted to attack him, and he had left nothing but destruction in his wake. He had hoped that the alien leader would have shown himself by now, assuming he wasn't already dead. He arrived at an intersecting hallway with four paths. This place really is a maze. It feels like I've been going in circles. Before he could choose what path to take he heard a voice in his cowl. One. He recognized this voice as Taku's grandpa. Mr. Fujiwara? This is a first, I know, but listen to me. I've done a full scan of the ship and I have a map of it here in front of me. I've been monitoring your movements and I believe I can guide you to where you need to go. 
That's great. I've wrecked a good bit of the ship and taken out a lot of the aliens. But I need to find a control room. I think that's where the leader may be. I can't pinpoint an exact area that could be called a control room. But I can tell you how to get to the energy source that's powering the ship. That'll do. Also, I just got in touch with Genos. He's on the ship and headed that way now. One was surprised to hear this. Genos is here? Where is he? If I had to guess, I'd say he's about five minutes from you. He's headed to the control room and both where I'm guiding him and the core are relatively close to each other. He wants to decipher the alien language so he can understand and fly the ship if need be. You may bump into each other, but until then take a left. I'll tell you when to turn again. Thank you, one said with gratitude as he went on his way. Control room. Jerry Jurgenship was freaking out. Their weapons were down, the majority of the crew was dead, and the Earth Dweller wasn't finished destroying the ship from the inside. He saw him through the cameras and saw that the direction he was going in it was only a matter of time before he reached the control room and if he got past them, the core. Surly Lord Boros could take care of him, but he didn't want to die before it got to that. Jerry Jurgenship? The voice of his leader called from behind him. The octopus alien and the others in the room turned to face their leader. Lord Boros! What's the problem here? Aye, it's this Earth Dweller. I don't know how he got onto the ship, but it only took him minutes to kill the majority of the crew and damage many of the ship's systems. Weapons, cloaking, shields, accelerations, all down, and he's not stopping. Boros looked at a camera screen and caught a flash of the intruder running down a hallway. He's coming. He thought as he hid a small smile. Boros turned to leave the room. Leave it be. Say what now? The terrified octopus squeaked. As long as the power core remains intact, the ship will stay airborne and operational. The captain left the room, leaving a bewildered crew behind as he didn't acknowledge the fact there was an intruder on the ship that was wrecking it from the inside and killing their men. Everyone went back to monitoring the ship still unable to fully process their leader's lacklessness when a wall exploded. When the dust cleared, they all saw the intruder standing there. One looked around the room. So this is the control room. Good thing I doubled back. I would have missed this place. You. He heard a voice in his head as a wave of malice washed over him. Tentacles climbed up to where he was until there was a large, blue, octopus-looking alien whose eyes and mouth were glowing. He felt a pressure in the air and saw that debris around the room were levitating covered in a yellow hue. You dare enter this place uninvited and bust up our ship, it said in his mind in perfect Japanese before rocks came flying at him at blinding speed. One stood firm as he skillfully caught and dodged the debris being fired at him. So you're a telekinetic. I could say the same for you. After all, you're the ones who came to my planet uninvited and attacked my city completely unprovoked. Silence! More rocks began to rise. Now I, Jerry Jurgenship, the supreme telekinetic power in the universe, will grind you into blood sausage. He fired all the debris at one. The assault kicked up dust that blinded his sight. When it cleared, he was shocked to see the Earth Dweller was completely unharmed. He fired those rocks many times faster than bullets and strengthened them enough to where they could piece this alien metal. One thought as he looked around. You're an impressive psychic, but don't boast if you can't impress. Jerry Jurgenship stunned. Wah dash, why you? He had never felt a blow to his pride like this. Fine you leave me no choice, worm. He raised a tentacle. Super telekinetic gravitational wave. The moment these words were uttered all the aliens in the room attempted to run away. However, the air in the room became heavy and they were all pinned to the ground. There is nowhere to run. My unparalleled telekinetic powers allow me to manipulate even the forces of gravity. Do you know what a black hole is, you ape? Inside the gravitational force is so strong that not even light itself cannot escape. He looked down at the earth dweller who just stood there casually as thousands pounds of pressure pressed down on him. What? He began to sweat nervously as he brought up more debris before making it spin around himself. The debris was moving so fast it created a tornado. Take this. 
telekinetic shower of rubble. The debris was launched like lasers with the shots tearing through the ship, leaving holes at the bottom. Jerry Yugensip chuckled lightly. There. I got him that time. He didn't sound too confident in his words. He was horrified to see that not only was the Earth Dweller still standing, but not a single one of his shots came close to hitting him. This was made evident from the visible holes his shot did make. One had snatched one of the rocks out of the air before it could pass by him. He tossed it up playfully before catching it. You know one of those may have stung if any of them had actually hit me. Your psychic powers are strong but you've got no aim. Plus you're just throwing pebbles around. You don't need powers to do that. Jerry Jurgenship was now sweating profusely with fear. A little advice. If you're gonna throw something at a target, make sure to focus on it. He ended this statement by flinging the rock square between Jerry Jurgenship's eyes, pulping his head like a balloon and splitting it in two. Jerry Jurgenship was in disbelief. Time slowed as he felt the process of death. How could I, Jerry Jurgenship, be impossible? were his final thoughts before his body dropped to the ground lifeless. One saw that most of the room was still intact, save for many cracked screens and all the aliens that were killed in the gravity attack. The power was still working at the very least and there was a language on it he didn't understand on the still working control panels. Well this place is still functioning for the most part. I'll have to think about how to fly this thing with Genos after I'm done with the boss. Now to that power core. He prepared to leave the room when he sensed a familiar presence. A moment later Genos entered the room. Hey Genos, about time you showed up. He said with a sly smile. Genos looked around the room. And here I wanted to get here before you trashed the place. He joked. Well technically that wasn't me. All I did was destroy a wall. But if you want to blame someone, blame him. He said pointing to something down the room. Genos walked to the ledge and saw the lifeless body of a blue octopus-looking alien. What even is that? A psychic octopus alien. He was strong, but sadly he had no aim. Well, that's a thing. Anyway, he walked past one and went to a control pad. He began hitting keys as he analyzed the information. His eyes were wide, signifying he was using his quirk. You're trying to learn that language. You sure you've got this? Remember who you're talking to, man. If I can learn ten languages in an hour, I can decipher this in minutes. You do what you need to do. I'll handle things here. One gave him a nod and in a flash of speed he bolted to his original destination, basically expecting the leader of these invaders to be there. On the ground. They were down to just two bodies left. Mirko had destroyed the last one and this was starting to wrap up. The martial artist on the scene could sense the alien's anger, fear. All Might's body was starting to emit steam. He turned to Keizo and unspoken words were said between the two as they both took the lead. All Might let off a barrage of full power smashes that knocked the alien back. Before it could correct itself Keizo leaped forward and with perfect precision pierced through its head, grabbing its marble. Found it, be gone! He crushed it between his fingers. The master sensed an attack just in time to see the remaining body lashing its arm at him. The attack connected with his side, sending the master crashing through several buildings. All eyes turned in the direction the master was sent in. Daddy! Kiyuki cried out for her father. That one looked like it hurt, Mirko added. The final body of Melzergard had an excited smile from his handiwork. Weak, weak, you're all so weak! He thought as he changed his stance. A change in tactics is all I needed. He eyed Michiko. I will slip past that sword and squeeze your head until it pops, woman. Michiko noticed he was eyeing her. What's with the look? If you think you can take me then be my guest. Melzergard morphed his right hand into a giant sword and rushed at Michiko. The master readied herself but the blade morphed into a bunch of giant spikes. Michiko slashed away at the spikes, backing up as they pierced the ground beneath her. She jumps back to get some distance allowing Mirko and Mirio to blitz him from both sides. Mirko barely avoids a counter with Mirio phasing through him to deck him in the gut. The blow knocks him back a bit before All Might rushes at him ready to smash him. 
Steam emitted from the hero as his fist collided with Melzergard's spiked hand. The alien's hand crumbled away as he was overpowered. All Might roared out as he smashed his enemy into the ground with the wind pressure roaring and shaking up the whole area. The battlefield went quiet for a moment with All Might still in place. Did that do it? Saki asked aloud. All eyes were on the symbol of peace whose body was enveloped in a plume of steam before revealing a skeleton of a man wearing a hero costume that didn't fit. Oh no! Mirio thought. All Might was out of time, and now his secret was exposed. He worried for his mentor when the remains of the alien swirled around him as it attempted to regenerate itself. All Might! He exclaimed as he rushed to help. All Might stood in the swirl around him. He could feel it. He had zero left to give. As he stood in the line of fire, his determination didn't waver in the slightest. Oafe may have been gone from him, but he was still All Might. His eyes were serious as they locked on to the alien's regenerating head. He shoved his right hand into the head with all the strength he could muster. The alien's eyes were full of shock and fear as he saw he was caught on the arm of the now weak-looking earthling who was holding his last marble. So much for intelligent life in the universe. Every time you regenerate you always start off with your head. After seeing it so many times even a monkey could figure it out. Melzogard let out an horrified yell before All Might crushed the marble and he melted away. Michiko rested her sword on her shoulder. So the battle is won, the victory is ours. Kiyuki excitedly hugged Saki. We did it! Yeah, but there's still the problem of that ship. The Ash Blonde said bluntly. No need to worry, Okoto. We can leave that to history's strongest disciple. The voice of Keizo said from behind them. Everyone turned around to see the master. He was unharmed. His shirt was gone revealing his ripped physique. I feel this will be over soon. Daddy! Kiyuki lunged at her father who happily caught her and spun her around like a princess. You took that hit on purpose, didn't you? Michiko asked, slyly. I wanted to gauge the strength of my opponent. Plus I could feel All Might getting weaker and was curious to what would happen. Mirko and Mirio walked over to the deflated hero. All Might? Mirio asked. The skeletal-looking man smiled. It's fine, young Togata. Night I was right. My embers couldn't burn for much longer. He looked up at the ship, smiling as he thought of the green-clad hero aboard who's probably already taken care of everything by now. You got this, right one. Mirko and Miro followed his line of sight, all seemingly on the same page as thoughts of the independent hero went through their minds. Kick their asses, kid! Mirko thought. One, it's up to you now, Mirio thought. On the ship. In a large room containing the energy core of the ship, Boros sits on a throne before the power core. His face was stoic, but he could barely contain his excitement. His time spent traveling here and the losses of his crew and damage to his ship would all be worth it soon. He was close. His match would come and finally free him of his incessant boredom. He sensed him on the other side of the door to the room. He's come! One ran along this large, dark hallway, making his way to the core of the ship. His eyes narrowed as he approached a large, double-sided door with a black sphere in the center. The door itself was massive, but that wasn't what concerned him. It was the presence he sensed on the other side of that door. He leaped into the air towards the center of the door and spun into a flying kick, breaking down the door with ease. The hero landed and the aura coming off of him was serious. It both excited and slightly scared the alien in the room. Boros looked down from his throne at the long-awaited adversary. The finest warrior this planet has to offer. I can sense no limit to his energy. He thought as he stood up. One looked before him at the alien. He saw that the alien before him was muscular, tall with light blue skin, a cyclops-like appearance with a blue eye and spiky pink hair. His skin had crack-like markings around it, and he wore gold armor, white pants and black spiky boots. One was on full alert as he could sense that this being was immensely powerful. He took a couple steps as he continued to get a feel for him. Are you the leader of these invaders? 
The alien stood firm in silence for a moment, as if processing his question. Wonderful! He answered excitedly in perfect Japanese. One was slightly startled by this. Even though he asked a question he wasn't expecting an answer, especially one in his own language. Before we fight, let us exchange names. I lead the pirate band known as the Dark Matter Thieves, and I am the dominator of the universe. My name is Boros. He spoke calmly and slowly. I'm a hero who fights for this world and its people, and my name is One. One, Boros said in acknowledgement with an excited, sharp toothy smile. Before we go any further I want to know something. How are you speaking my language? That octopus alien was a psychic so it made sense for him. Am I to assume you are a psychic too? You mean Jerry Jürgenship? It's no secret. It's a genetic ability that allows for universal translation. My species can learn any language upon hearing it. Many races across the universe also share this to varying degrees. I see. Back to the matter at hand then. I don't know what the dominator of the universe wants with Earth, but you almost wiped the city I call home off the map. Why? What I want with Earth. Boros began to descend the stairs and approach one. There is an item on this planet I'm interested in acquiring. Our scanners showed it is buried deep under your planet's crust. Our initial bombardment was to clear the way to excavate it. But more than that there exists a prophecy. Prophecy? What do you mean? One said curiously. I was once a traveler, exploring the universe, ravaging everything in sight. But I was too strong. I eventually found there were none left who could face me. I came to know the torment of utter, all-encompassing boredom. However, a great seer told me that on a distant planet, there was a being who was my match, that could rekindle my passion for battle. That was nearly twenty years ago. Do you have any concept of the distance I have traveled to get here? My men felt the prophecy was a ruse, a lie to distract my attention and lure me away. A smile spread across his lips when he finally stood in front of the hero. But now I see it was no lie. You're the one, it was certainly true. He towered over the shorter earthling. Come and give stimulation to my existence. That is why I am here. With blinding speed one punched Boros square in the chest, sending him rocketing through several large pillars before crashing into a final one, cracking it. His armor was shattered, slowly falling off of him as he lay there. Are you serious? And I thought there was intelligent life out there in the universe. You can't go around attacking other planets. Just he'll liven up your boring little life. He took his stance. All this because of a bored, petty alien. I don't have all day so come at me, fool. Boros fell out of the pillar, arms spread, hands clenched as his aura shifted. This armor that was meant to seal my immeasurable, indescribable power has now been broken. One raised an eyebrow behind his cowl at these words. Okay, he replied unconcerned with a confident smile. Boros crossed his arms, his skin turned black, his body bulged and became more muscular with the cracks on his body as well as his hair beginning to glow. He flexed his body and there was a surge of purple, electric energy. The power was so great that it shook the area, creating wind pressure so strong it sent debris all over the place. One swatted away the rocks that would have hit him. Boros' body flickered with power until he stopped, smiling excitedly as he was enveloped in an aura of energy. IT is time! He burst forward, rocketing towards one with his right fist cocked back. One raised his left forearm to block the blow, the shockwave of the impact rippled throughout the room, cracking the ground where they stood. Boros was excited one could block a hit from him, one on the other hand was surprised a bit. So that talk wasn't just boasting. He's definitely stronger than I expected. I may need to get serious here. He thought as Boros roared while unleashing a blurring barrage of punches that he blocks with his left forearm. He deflects a right punch to the left and uses his right to deflect a left punch. This created an opening for a moment, and in that same motion one quickly shifts and thrusts his right elbow into Boros' stomach knocking him back. One pressed forward, jumping at Boros with a right spin kick. 
The space pirate blocked one's kick, grabbing his leg before spinning and tossing him into a pillar. One corrects himself in the air and front flips forward off the pillar and over Boros who attempted to chase after him only to crash through the pillar himself. One lands and turns around and raises his right forearm to block a punch from his enemy who is back on him in an instant. Boros then tries to kick him. One quickly shifts his body backwards, avoiding Boros' kick and using his leg as a vault the hero balances on his right arm and spins to land a double side kick to Boros' arm and head. The pirate leader goes crashing through several walls as one speed blitzes after him. Boros launches himself off the wall that stopped him. He and one rocket at each other fists cocked back ready to clash. The two collide, landing a simultaneous punch to the face that sends them both flying back. Boros jumps off a wall and rockets back after one. The hero corrects himself and flips backwards. Boros rushes him, like a homing missile. He locks onto his target as the two trade blows that shake up the whole ship. The two blurs end up on the ceiling of the room. They jump off it and fight upside down before a clash knocks them in opposite directions into pillars. Both correct themselves and launch off the pillars. In a flash of speed their fists meet in a powerful clash. There was a pause in the battle from the thud of something hitting the floor. Both combatants' backs were to each other. Boros had a look of shock as he registered his missing right arm. Impressive. He turned to the back of the hero. Even though my true power's been unleashed on you, you're still able to keep up. One turned to face him. I've had some pretty good training. He took his stance again. You're strong, but I think that's a good enough warm-up. Boros's shocked expression was ever more prevalent. You're holding back? I'm a martial artist. We never go all out at the beginning of a fight. Controlling your strength is important after all. Boros smiled happily at these words. His energy flared as he rushed back at one, firing off a flurry of one-handed punches that one easily blocked. The alien chased the hero across the ship, tearing through floor after floor as the hero outpaced him. Boros picked up the pace, zigzagging up a wall before getting around once guard and landing a punch in the stomach and launching him through the ceiling. He continued his assault only for one to counter and punch back. Boros ate the hit as the two traded blows while rising upward. They tear through so many floors that they were wrapped in metal as they made it to the roof. The two clashed, with Boros blocking a right punch from one and the hero bringing up his right leg to block a kick. The force destroyed the metal around them and they both were sent back. One tucks into a ball as he backflips landing gracefully while Boros skid and tore through the roof of the ship before stopping. The look on his face is pure excitement. He pumps his fist as he eyed the hero. Nice moves. As I thought, you are strong. His body began to erupt with a blue energy. Of the myriad of beings I've battled thus far, only you have lasted this long. One couldn't help but smile from a fight like this. Hmm. <laughs> And you're the first to make me push this hard since my masters. Growling. The air became heavy from his energy as it shot into the air. Now to release the destructive energy held within me. He fired a giant energy beam at his opponent. Any being hit by it would find even their bones vaporized. One quickly took the stance for Batajutsu and formed his right hand into a chop as if drawing a sword. Bring it on. He confidently exclaimed as the attack narrowed in on him. Atomic Slash! He cut the blast 100 times with his bare hand. The beam exploded in a burst of fire, destroying much of the roof and creating a fiery haze around them. One could sense Boros coming to attack from his right side. Behind you! He announced. Without even looking one brought up his left hand to catch his fist and in that same motion slammed his right back fist into Boros' gut. The force of both of these attacks dispersed the haze and covered the area in smoke. One was still holding on to Boros who spit up blood as well as had a large, wide hole in his chest. You should know I sensed you coming, but it's not much of a sneak attack if you announce it. He let go of Boros allowing him to wobble back a little. Boros put a hand to his chest, surprised at the injury and even more that he didn't see it. He swallowed the pain, the look in his eyes implying he was still in control of this fight. He smiled confidently. 
You were a worthy opponent, but the winner of this battle is clear. My species won the war for survival amidst the harsh environment of our home world. We possess the ultimate and regenerative abilities. I in particular have the godlike traits of self-healing, physical prowess, and latent energy beyond your comprehension. A wound that would be fatal for you heals on me in mere moments. The stub of his severed arm began to pulsate and the flesh in his chest began to regrow. By focusing my energy on my injuries, I can exponentially accelerate the healing process. A fresh arm regrew from the stub and the hole in his chest was restored with new flesh. Both injuries were white and wet at first, but a moment later turned black to match his skin. Good as new. He chuckled to himself, patting his stomach and clenching his fist. You on the other hand will only get injured more, all while your stamina is wasted fighting an uphill battle you never had a chance to win. Still, I thank you. This is the most fun I've had in centuries. I almost don't want it to end. There was a pause, one stood firm, registering his words as a wind passed over the battlefield. The hero smiled confidently. Impressive, truly impressive. All this power, and you use it for space piracy? Shane, if things were different you'd have been a great sparring partner for me. Boros' smile faded. What is this? A lecture? No, we're past that. I'm just slightly sad this has to end with only one of us walking away. One of the first lessons I learned is that you should never fear the skills of those who spend more time talking than fighting. He released a wave of power aura along with a smile that gave Boros chills. And also your comment about me tiring and being injured more? Keep in mind I've hit you a lot more than you've hit me, and the punches you did land haven't had any power behind them. It's unwise to assume the state of an enemy who still isn't going all out. So are you done justifying yourself? Boros' smile returned only this time one could sense a flare of anger. He flexed his body and erupted with energy. Not yet! He roared. The ground was shaking. The air became heavy again with air pressure roaring and lightning tearing across the battlefield. Boros' energy created a dome with him at the center, looking inside one could see that his opponent was undergoing another transformation. His black skin was becoming white, along with his eye and his hair seemed to have grown longer. One readied himself as Boros got into a starting sprint position, the energy continued to surge. Meteoric burst! One's eyes widened as crossed his arms to block a punch by Boros. However, the attack was too pronged and he was engulfed in a giant beam of energy that vaporized all it touched. The force from the hit knocked him back and he was inside the blast, not only that he could feel his suit was damaged. The right upper half of his suit was gone along with his smartwatch, and part of the left side of his face and hair was exposed. One didn't have time to dwell on this as in an instant Boros was inside the blast with him and began wailing on him from all angles. His punches were heavy, and his speed was much greater. One tries to counter but Boros dodges and sends him flying with a kick that sends him tearing through the roof of the ship. Boros bursts with power as he rockets after him, his energy incinerating everything in his path. The energy from my body transforms into a propelling force. One kicks off the air and soars back at Boros, he throws a punch, but the alien blasts around him, shooting past him. As he turns to chase he suddenly feels his right leg grabbed. Boros began to violently spin before throwing him, elevating power and speed to a level beyond the limitation of living flesh. He stated as he appeared above one, hands clenched together to smash him down. He attacked with all his strength, smashing the hero to the ground. As the hero goes flying Boros rockets past him, beating him to the ground before blasting back up, one had crossed his arms to black that last blow and saw Boros shoot past him. But as tried to correct himself it only made an opening for Boros to land a kick so powerful the energy behind it encased the two in a ball of lighting that fired energy all over the place. Boros' kick nailed one right in the stomach and with one final yell he followed through with his attack and the hero was launched into the air leaving a chain of shockwaves. One felt the power of Boros' kick, it was by far his strongest attack of the whole fight. He caught one final glimpse of the alien before he was rocketed into the air. 
He was still reeling from the kick so much he couldn't stop himself. It all happened so fast and to his surprise he was going higher and higher and higher until he crashed into solid rock. Damn, I let my guard down. He thought as he sat up. Noting he couldn't inhale, he held his breath. His eyes widened as he saw the planet Earth in front of him. Scanning his surroundings he saw the ground he stood on had a whitish-gray color. The sky above him was nothing but the void of space and he instantly knew where he was. I'm on the moon! He thought as he quickly stood up. Feeling the effects of zero gravity he stood slightly mesmerized. He smiled as he picked up a good-sized moon rock. So I can handle the harsh conditions of space. Noted. Taku's gonna flip at this one. He quickly broke the moon rock into two pieces and put them in one of his pockets, for evidence. He got in a squat position. This guy knocked me all the way to the freaking moon. Time to stop holding back. He thought as he jumped back to Earth, leaving a massive crater on the moon. Back on Earth Boros looked up into the sky, certain his opponent was now a lifeless corpse among the stars. He breathed heavily. Doing this places enormous stress on my body, similar to anaerobic exercise. As a result it shortens my life. Therefore, it should only be used as a final trump card to settle fights as quickly as possible. He lost his balance for a moment. How's that one? That's what you get for not taking me seriously. Still, I would have liked to see what you being, serious, would have looked Lee dash dot. His thoughts were interrupted by a loud crash of something landing on the ship. Genos had gotten the controls operational and prepared to fly the ship outside of Muzirifu when the whole thing started shaking. What the hell now? He thought as he felt his area of the ship rise up. Is the ship tipping? The dust cleared and out steps one from a large, burning metal crater. The hero let out a long, refreshing inhale then exhaled. Well, I made it back. Don't call me a mathematician because I have no idea how I was able to land back on this ship from space. He let out a light chuckle. Guess my master was right. Instead of worrying about outcomes sometimes you should just muddle through and things will work out. Boros looked at him completely bewildered. I apologize for earlier Boros. While I said martial artists don't go all out at the start, and that's true. I should have gotten serious when you powered up your meteoric bursting. So with my pride as a martial artist I'll take you seriously, and show you my one and only original martial arts technique. Flowing Instinct Boros was intrigued by this. One closed his eyes, took a crisp breath and whirled his arms in a tranquil fluid motion before taking his stance. If the alien could see the Psychokin, he would see the hero's body was enveloped in a whitish blue hue. Boros eyed his opponent. He couldn't feel a physical change, but everything about him was different. One then opened his eyes and though the look in his exposed left green eye was calm it seemed as though he was staring into the core of his being. Boros took a battle-ready stance. What is this? Something's different about him. Why am I sweating? This is the seriousness I wanted to see so why am I afraid? He clenched his fists. You infuriating man. He ran towards one. I'll give this everything I've got. He declared before activating meteoric burst and blasting towards one. Boros unleashed a streak of blinding attack on one from all angles. But every single attack thrown at the hero was dodged with minimal effort at the last possible second. One dipped his head to dodge a kick from Boros that was a millimeter from connecting with the back of his head. In his frustration Boros corrected himself in front of one and threw a left punch. One shifted his head right to dodge at the last second. In a flash of speed he landed a brutal left punch to Boros' stomach. The alien's eye became bloodshot red as he spat up blood and the hero's punch sent him flying. He gets his bearings and skids through the metal, landing on all fours. Though he's spitting up blood, bleeding from the mouth and has multiple ruptured organs he was excited about this situation. That's the way one. You are indeed worth the effort. He stood up ready to come back. His eye never left one who disappeared in a flash. What? He thought as he quickly saw one behind him, head cocked with his back to him. 
Boros then felt indescribable pain as the air itself seemed to beat him senseless before his body exploded into bloody pieces. Boros was conscious of this given the horror in a large piece of his eyeball. Reacting before death could claim him he used all his strength to pull himself back together. I will defeat you! He roared before lunging at one only for their fists to collide with his being destroyed. One pressed his assault, nailing Boros with hundreds of blows, destroying his body again before he regenerated himself. Before he could react a punch sent him into the air. In a flash of speed one was on him in midair, he spun and bashed him with a triple kick with the final blow destroying most of Boros' body only leaving his chest and above. The alien's remains hit the ground tearing through metal with a loud crash. One lands on the ground and slowly approaches Boros, who grit his teeth and a new body regenerated. He picked himself up off the ground, frustration was clear on his face, he was losing power and he couldn't maintain meteoric burst for much longer. Still, his pride would let him give up yet, he could dig within himself and push past his limits. Don't get confident, one! He roared as he got his second wind and his body erupted with power. He focused the power into the eye in his chest. I think I'm feeling my second wind. Let us continue. One stood firm as his opponent charged his attack. He took a stance as if to rush forward while releasing a massive wave of power aura. The emotional energy of his willpower converted into a light green fiery aura that took the shape of a giant dragon with yellow eyes with him inside it. Boros was shocked to see this. What is that strange looking creature? He thought as he finished charging. No matter. He released a massive beam of black-blue energy. One rushed forward, the space became distorted around him as the dragon roared. He jumped into a flying kick. Once will. He called out as the attacks collided. Once attack overwhelmed Boros' beam, the alien looked in horror as the creature drew closer to him. What is this? It doesn't feel like he's overpowering me so what's going on here? He thought when he saw the distortion in the air originating from once attack, the same began to happen to his beam. Impossible! He's bending space! Boros was consumed by the dragon as once foot connected with his chest. Every cell in his body screamed in agony as he was blasted by the attack, carrying him across the roof of the ship until he crashed into the final tower with a powerful crash and the dragon dissipated. One stood where he kicked Boros, noting the scar his attack left on the ship and watched as there was nothing left of the alien pirate. No, it's not over yet. He thought as he spotted a mound of flesh that slowly rose up and after a moment Boros was restored. One could tell just from looking at him he was on his last legs and the way he was breathing heavily implied he was close to death. Boros was breathing heavily, almost hyperventilating, he couldn't take this anymore. Either his final trump card would win this fight, or he dies. His eye locked onto one. Growling! I will defeat you! He roared as he leaped into the air. His body glowed yellow, his eye became black and his energy scattered with electricity. All of my energy will be released, blasting you and this planet straight to hell. His power was so intense the scattering electricity was incinerating all the metal it came in contact with. Boros had accumulated all his power and released. Collapsing star roaring cannon. The blast came as a humongous yellow-blue beam of energy larger than anything he's fired until now. As the planet-busting blast approached him, one stood firm. I won't let you destroy my world. Sky split or smash. One punched the beam with everything he had, dispersing the beam in two and the shockwave of it nailing Boros. The shockwave was so powerful it parted clouds on a global scale. A large chunk of the planet was seeing clear skies at the moment with a pleasant breeze that flowed on the wind. When the chaos of the clash faded there lay Boros, an ash-like, armless, legless corpse on the floor. Did. I lose? I can feel nothing. The wind blew over the battlefield, almost signifying a calming victory. One looked at his defeated opponent. You're still conscious. If it means anything you're the strongest person I've ever fought, I hope that brings you peace. The prophecy rang true. The battle was a hard-fought one. 
Though they were enemies, one didn't have the heart to tell a dying man whose entire reason for all of this was to regain excitement for battle by fighting his equal. He did take him seriously at the end but he still didn't go all out. Yeah it was. Either it was his perception or the process of death making him aware of everything, Boros could tell that wasn't the truth. You. Lie. You're still holding back aren't you? I never stood a chance. It wasn't even a battle. You. Obliterated me. He chuckled lightly. So much for the words of prophecies. You're just. Too strong one. One could hear the disappointment in his voice and felt kinda bad about it. Boros. That thing you came here looking for that's under the city. Is it something I should be worried about? There was a pause as the alien registered the question. That you wanna know, huh? There is an item. Known as a cosmic cube. According to stories. You can use them to commune with God. God? One said confused. The beings. That defy all understanding. Use these items to spread their influence and monitor the universe. The fact that there's one. On this planet says they've had a hand in it in some way. I thought it would be interesting to have one. This god or gods, what do they want with my planet? What? Ev dash dot. Were Boros last raspy words before life left his body. He's dead. One looked at the alien's lifeless body. Boros, I swear as a martial artist I'll remember our battle in my heart always. As he was paying his respects he heard an explosion and saw the end of the ship burst with purple energy. The ship rumbled as it began to fly so fast one had to grip onto the roof to keep from falling off. It quickly blasted out of Mizutafu and was over the Pacific Ocean in seconds, just when he thought it was over this happened. What the hell? In the control room. God damn it! Genos roared as he guided the ship upward. His one working screen gave him a view of the front of the ship, and he was trying to get this ship as high as he could before it blew. The core had ruptured because of one and the alien leader's fight. It was a massive source of energy that was now on the verge of exploding. In the midst of his steering he got a call on his cell. Using his right hand he answered seeing that it was one. Hey dude. Don't. Hey dude. Me. What the hell is happening in there, Genos? Don't know what the hell you idiots did a minute ago, but you ruptured the core of the ship. Now the damn thing is overloading and about to blow. I'm trying to fly this thing out of Earth's atmosphere because I don't know how big this explosion will be. I'm kinda hanging on for my life out here. So is there anything I can do? You can breathe in Earth's thermosphere, right? That, and survive the conditions of space on the moon with no suit and atmospheric re-entry. Well that's something you better tell me the fuck about later. I don't care how you do it, but launch the ship further into space when we get up that high. Got it! One exclaimed. He held on as the ship rocketed higher and higher into the air, he saw as they closely inched closer and closer to space. Thanks to his high perception he could spot a satellite in the distance. Guess this is high enough. One dug his feet into the ship. Like that time I surfed the battleship. One thought as he did a backflip and using his feet he rocketed the ship high into space. He pulled out his phone as he let himself fall back to earth. After a moment Genos answered. Was that high enough for you? He joked. Perfect my guy. This shouldn't do any damage to earth but I'll keep going just to be safe. Thanks Genos. Didn't know you were a fan of suicide missions. Shut the hell up. All of us aren't invulnerable like you so somebody's gotta do it. There is still a small chance I may die here so if that happens at least have them make a city block after me. On an unrelated note this is work I'm not getting back. He said, noting the time it took to clone and make Genos. Will do. But I thought if Genos was destroyed your consciousness would just go back to your body. That's the plan in theory. If my beta waves convince my brain I've actually died I may slip into a coma. But thumbs up. With your luck? Suck it Midoriya. But seriously, are you sure about this, Genos? Kinda too late to turn back now, man. He caught a glimpse of the moon as they passed it. 
He had a surprised look on his face at what he saw. What the hell happened to the moon? What do you mean? There's a huge crater on it, like the size of a continent. Oh, I think that was me. I had to jump back to Earth from the moon a while ago. You're definitely telling me about that later. He felt an explosion tear through the ship, getting closer and closer. This is it. Don't judge me. He yelled as the explosion reached him and spread throughout the entire ship. In the void of space a massive explosion went off the blast was so bright it could be seen from the earth. The explosion destroyed the ship entirely. The only thing that remained was Geno's core that floated in the void of space. One saw the explosion in space. His eyes never left it as he allowed himself to fall back to earth. Thanks, Taku. He rolled over and flew back to Muzidafu. He could sense the city was still on edge. He flew to the mayor's office and informed them that it was over. He notified the prime minister who let the world leaders know the crisis was averted with seconds to spare before their nuclear options. All of Musidifu celebrated having survived this situation. The media was beginning to have a field day with every outlet reporting on the defeated aliens. The fallen heroes were mourned. The heroes who had fought the alien on the ground seemed to have vanished, however it didn't take the media long to get their names. Many heroes voiced their opinions of not being able to help in the situation in Musidifu, namely Endeavor. All Might, who was surprisingly a skinny skeleton of a man, came out and announced his retirement that same day, shocking the entire world. And as for the finer details of the alien attack, the only person who had those details was one who no one could find after the attack. However, many claim to have caught a glimpse of the independent hero flying across the city in a torn costume. Midoriya Residence Inko, Izuku, Eri and Takumi were chilling at the house. Melissa had left to be with All Might and Izuku had arrived two hours ago in a tattered costume. He phased through the door. Thankfully Eri didn't see him and Taku was able to sneak him to his room to change. He was glad his friend woke up like normal and didn't slip into a coma. The issue of his destroyed smartwatch would be quickly rectified. But Taku was proud it took an alien's energy blast to destroy his suit along with the smartwatch. Once he got changed the quartet started watching the news coverage. Man, a lot sure can happen in two hours. Izuka stated. Big facts. That whole thing was what, a half hour more or less? Taku said as he stretched on the couch, resting his head on Eri's lap. The young girl didn't fully understand what was going on but was still happy to give Taku a lap pillow. You're so silly, Takuni. It's part of my charm, Lil Eri. He smiled. By the way, you know we left your ball at the White Fox, right? I figured. We'll go get it later. Izuku responded casually. There's plenty of daylight left. We can link back up with the girls if you want. Oh yeah, our karaoke plans got put on hold, didn't they? It's like what, five o'clock? Let's get back on that. Let's do that. But Aries' lap is a bit too comfortable right now, so when I can break free, we can go. He joked with a smile. He used his hanging left hand to casually give a thumbs up. Izuka caught the gesture and returned one of his own. Inko caught the unspoken message between the two boys, and would very much press to find the details later. She was filled with a sense of happiness and pride. She had been watching the event unfold since it started, and soon she would come to learn that these two boys saved the city if not the world today. And that's a wrap, my extraordinary time-traveling companions. Part 10 of R. What if Deku became Saitama? Adventure has left us in awe and craving for the next installment. I hope you enjoyed this mind-blowing chapter as much as I did, filled with heart-stopping action, unexpected twists, and moments that touched our very souls. If you haven't already, make sure to smash that subscribe button and join our incredible community of curious minds. Your support means the world to us. Now, it's your turn to shine. Drop a comment below and let me know your thoughts reactions, and predictions for the future. I can't wait to dive into some mind-bending discussions with you. And remember, keep dreaming, keep exploring, and keep being the heroes of your own stories. Until our next adventure, this is Kronos, 
signing off with a big smile and a heartfelt thank you for being a part of this incredible journey.